Good morning, everybody. It's Tom Carper on a train. On a train because of my friend Joe Biden. Joe Biden ended up in uh, Wilmington last night, slept in his own bed so he could go to the uh, St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, breakfast and mass at St. Patrick's Church, which was literally halfway between my house and the train station. Unbeknownst to me, the whole city of Wilmington practically was shut down. And I now traffic was moving. And uh, I know the police pretty well, but there's no way they're going to let me go through. So I end up missing my train and uh, tried to thought, well, maybe I'll just drive down. But they also shut down access to I-95 for the most part. So I end up on the next train and I'm joining you uh, remotely. But I've never done this before, so we'll see how it, uh, how it works out. If I'm jumping around, it's because the train is jumping around. I'm not jittery. It's just a train. It's a, a saying uh, our, our pastor uses from time to time. He says, when... Uh, and God uh, closed the door, he opens a window. In this case, he sent another train that happened to be going south, and I'm on that train. Well, we're, uh, Shelly, I wish I could be there with you. Hopefully, I'll be there within about 40, uh, 40 minutes or so. But uh, I just want to put this today's uh, hearing on uh, water infrastructure, clean water, clean, clean drinking water. I want to put it in context if I, if I could. The reason why we're having this hearing is because we're unable to come to agreement last, uh, the end of last year when we worked on uh, WERDA, passed a good WERDA bill. The WERDA bill, you may recall, was something that all of us worked on, all of us contributed to on our committee and off the committee as well. I believe that uh, in the, the WERDA bill, which ended up passing as part of the, uh, the uh, omnibus, as I recall, had, I, I think, 46 projects. It's Army Corps of Engineers project, 46 projects. They were valued at about $15 million. I think there were another 27 or so feasibility studies in in uh, WERDA. And I think there's a, a couple of billion dollars worth of harbor maintenance uh, uh, projects from the trust, the harbor maintenance trust fund to go on top of the, uh, an earlier $2 billion, so that's $4 billion of projects uh, uh, paid for out of the harbor maintenance trust fund. That was all uh, the work we did right at the end of the, of the year where it was included in, in the, the omnibus uh, trust fund. And uh, when we, uh, you know, there, there, as people ask me like oftentimes, uh, sometimes when I'm standing at Biden station on the platform waiting for the train, people say to me, why can't you guys and gals just work to find stuff to work on together? As it turns out, there's, there's great uh, bipartisan support for, for uh, infrastructure writ large and not just water projects, not just Army Corps of Engineers, just not, not just clean water, drinking water, uh, uh, wastewater treatment projects. Uh, harbor maintenance projects, which agreement on uh, broadband deployment. I think we put in the uh, the American uh, Rescue uh, uh, program. We had in the broadband uh, uh, projects. I want to see like another six billion or so uh, that was uh, passed about a week or, or two uh, ago, and uh, we have uh, were I think well on our way toward uh, the running start with respect to service transportation. Um, on February 10th, uh, Senator Capito, Senator uh, Inhofe, Senator Cardin, and I joined uh, President uh, Biden in the Oval Office, along with Vice President, along with um, the Secretary of Transportation, for uh, just a great, uh, almost an hour-long meeting on, on service trans and service transportation. The, uh, that was followed up uh, on, th on February 19th. Senator Capito and I sent out letters to uh, all 98 other senators, asking everybody to submit to uh, to our committee. Their uh, service transportation priorities, and we gave them a month uh, deadline, uh, March 19th, to finish uh, doing that. We're beginning to to hear uh, get uh, those responses. We did a similar kind of thing with Word. We always ask our colleagues, "What are your pri uh, uh, priorities?" Do the same thing with the respect to service transportation, and we're beginning to hear from everybody. We the last to did the due date on it is is March the 19th. May we call? We had our first hearing on service transportation. It was February 24th. Couple of governors there from uh, Michigan, from Maryland, from Bend State. We had a uh, uh, mayor from uh, Denver. We had a uh, uh, commissioner, I call it Secretary of Transportation from from uh, New Hampshire. Great, great here, great attendance. I think everybody, from all but two people on the committee, participated either live or virtually at that hearing. And uh, more recently, for March the 9th, I spent about uh, I guess half an hour or so on the phone with, with Secretary Buttigieg. Uh, just talking about service transportation, trying to make sure we're on the uh, the same uh, wavelength. So I, I mentioned those things just to uh, let's see this, what I'm forgetting here. Oh yeah, uh, we're going to have a number of hearings uh, between now and the end of uh, the end of May. I hope shall, uh, Senator Capito and I hope to be able to, uh, for a committee to be able to report out service transportation reauthorization by uh, the uh, 
the, the before Memorial uh, before Memorial Day. And we'll have uh, a number of hearings between now and then. My hope is we'll be able to have our next hearing in honor about April 14th. That would be a hearing on vehicle miles travel, 50 state pilot, and just to see how the VMT pilots are going on the other states. That's we're doing that already. We're uh, a little more than a, uh, a month or two into the, the new Congress, but we're not wasting any time. We reported out, I think uh, if we report out our service transportation bill for Memorial Day, that'll be about two months ahead of our schedule from two years uh, earlier. So that would be great. Let me go ahead and I can is just uh, make a, uh, a go ahead and make my statement. We're just pulling in to Union Station. Hopefully they won't throw me off this, the, the train. This is a through train. So but I just want to say uh, we've been joined today by an outstanding panel of uh, witnesses, uh, Keisha Powell, uh, Shelly uh, Chard, Michael McNulty, and Nathan O. I hope I got your name right there, Nathan. But we thank you uh, all for joining us either in person or remotely. I want to begin today by thanking Senators Duckworth, uh, Cardin, Lummis for their leadership in exploring legislation to address the challenges facing our nation through our neglect and lack of investment in America's water infrastructure. And uh, take the case of, uh, take the case. This it is wild. Ah, here we go. It's on the back side. The, the Amtrak police printed this out for me. It's a train station. Isn't that great? But uh, if you think about it, the admonition to make the necessary investments in our water infrastructure can be traced all the way back to the words of Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence when he talked about inalienable rights and uh, that included life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think we all know and recognize that in order to have life, frankly, in order to have liberty and happiness, uh, we need water. And there's also a moral uh, uh, moral admonition, uh, Matthew, what is Matthew 25, when I was thirsty, did you give me to drink? And the idea in Matthew 25 is if you give me like dirty water, you know, polluted water to drink, the idea is clean water. And so we have a moral obligation. And we have, uh, in terms of what our founding fathers had in mind for us, we have, I think, that responsibility to too. But sadly, the reality for far too many communities around our country is that they don't have reliable access to water that's essential for daily life. One case in particular, we'll never forget Flint, Flint, Michigan in 2014, lead contamination, Flint's drinking water created a humanitarian disaster, leaving thousands of families without water to drink, to bathe in, or to cook with. It's just a, a new, new, one of our newest members of our, our committee is, uh, is uh, Debbie Sabanon. This is something that she worked on then, she works on even today. But sadly, Flint is not an isolated uh, incident. With the current state of our water systems, there are multiple Flints waiting to happen across our, our country. Every four years, the American Society of Civil Engineers puts out a report card. And uh, that report card assesses the state of our nation's infrastructure. I think we've created a couple of uh, uh, posters here for you. We did see how we're doing on how our, grade, how our grades are coming along. But the grades continue to be a cause for concern. We look at this, uh, these charts. Uh, last month's report card, our aging water drinking system earned a C minus, estimating that there is a water main break every two minutes in America. I'm told that in the course of a day, that's enough water to fill, get this, over 9,000 swimming pools, over 9,000 swimming pools. I had my staff check that out and they said, no, that's true. Our wastewater treatment facilities fared even worse, a grade of D plus. Our nation has over 1 million miles, 1 million miles of sewer wastewater pipes. And on average, they're 45 years old. Many of the systems uh, date back uh, more than a century. Those aren't the kind of grades that uh, my wife and I ever wanted our boys to shook up on the shows, and I'm sure they're not the kind of grades that you want your kids or your grandchildren to bring home either. Um, these poor grades that we've just seen uh, demonstrated show how cities and towns around the nation struggle to maintain their drinking water systems and prepare to maintain their drinking water systems and, uh, and, and prepare for the threats that emanate from climate change, including extreme storms and rising sea levels. In, uh, in its annual uh, uh, high-risk report published this, uh, just this month, GAO, Government Accountability Office, urges that climate resilience measures be taken to water infrastructure projects to receive federal financial assistance. I think we have a chart here. And I'm going to quote right from the chart. It says, Congress should consider requiring that climate resilience be incorporated in the planning of all drinking water and wastewater projects that receive federal financial assistance. That's the words of GAO. That that emphasis on climate resilience makes a whole lot of sense when we look at the water-related crises caused by extreme weather just last month in many parts of the South. In Oklahoma, Texas, Jackson, Mississippi, millions of families were left without access to safe drinking water. That's a disaster that should never have occurred, and it's a disaster that should never 
occur again. But there is some good news on this front. It's because fortunately, when we invest in the water infrastructure, that investment not only pays for itself, but also helps uh, in growing the economy of our country. Water touches just about every part of our uh, economy, perhaps even more than many people may realize. Commerce Department tells us when we add one job in the water and wastewater industry, it leads to the creation of additional four jobs, four jobs in America. I'm reminded once again, I saw, words I often repeat, Albert Einstein, in adversity lies opportunity. Thoroughly, the adversity we face is great, but it proceeds today and makes smart investments in cleaner, safer water for our communities. Those investments more than pay for themselves in the long run through the creation of good paying American jobs. And with that having been said, we're pulling into Union Station. Thank you, God. And I can't believe this is working. <laughs> with that, let me turn to our ranking member, uh, Senator Shelley Capito. For, uh, for her opening remarks and to ask her to go ahead and uh, when she finishes up to start introducing our witnesses and I'm going to go have lunch and I'll join you sometime and uh, I'm not going to do that. Run from the train station to where you guys are and before to join you uh, shortly. Thank you so much. See you in a little bit. Shelly, take it away. Thank Got you. Got it. Uh, I want to thank the chairman. Uh, he seems a little jumpy today. I don't know about what, what you guys think. In any event, good effort there on the, on the part of our chairman, and I want to thank him also uh, again for his leadership and and putting this hearing together. I want to thank our witnesses, and I very much look forward to hearing their discussions on this important topic. This committee values your perspectives uh, on the challenges facing this nation's water infrastructure, as well as your thoughts on effective solutions to address these challenges. So I appreciate our regular conversations that I have with the chairman. Um, he can't hear me, but I, I think he knows how much those mean to me and to both of us. Every day, Americans rely on the infrastructure that supports our drinking water systems and our wastewater systems. These are systems that the nation prides itself on, providing access to clean and safe water at the turn of a handle. Unfortunately, this nation is facing critical challenges to the resilience of these systems, with many of the rural communities being disproportionately affected by the wide array of water infrastructure challenges. Small rural communities are particularly uh, strained and need support to ensure protection and availability of this vital resource. Many systems in my state are, of West Virginia are very old, as I'm sure that's the same in every single state. I mean, when I'm talking very old, I'm talking in excess of 100 years. And some of our systems do not even know where their pipes are uh, because the infrastructure uh, predates the mapping research. Additionally, reports have shown that only one quarter of the water West Virginia systems pay, water systems pay to have treated and pumped even reach a faucet. So water's a valuable resource and think of all of that that we're losing. And of course, some rural communities lack municipal drinking water service and sanitary wastewater infrastructure entirely. These challenges are not unique to my state. They exist throughout the country in rural and urban and tribal communities alike. And the time for action to address these challenges is right now. I am committed to addressing the challenges facing the nation's water infrastructure expeditiously in a bipartisan way and with an, uh, with an approach that pri prioritizes the need. Chairman Carper has set an aggressive timeline to address these needs legislatively. I appreciate that. I've been pleased to negotiate with him to address water infrastructure priorities, and I think we are very close to a final bipartisan agreement. Last year, several drinking water and wastewater provisions approved unanimously by this committee in America's Drinking Water Infrastructure Act and the Drinking Water, and the Drinking water Infrastructure Act failed to reach the finish line before the end of the Congress. I think the chairman mentioned that. These carefully negotiated bipartisan provisions are the perfect jumping off point to address the challenges this Congress has in a timely and bipartisan fashion and clearing the way for new concepts in future legislation. It is vital that we continue to work across the aisle to provide solutions that ensure communities across the country are able to meet their water demands. This responsibility includes a recognition that continued funding at the federal level is necessary to address the various hindrances preventing resilient water, excuse me, resilient infrastructure among our water systems. But we also need to acknowledge that continued or increased funding is only a solution insofar as the funding targets the actual infrastructure where needs are most apparent. And those needs can take many forms. They include priorities I have worked on, such as ensuring that systems have pipes that do not leak, ensuring there is a sustainable water workforce in place, 
to maintain and operate uh, continued and new infrastructure investments. I think we need to also start really considering the serious risks posed by our cybersecurity threats. Different public water operators face different issues, and we have a duty to ensure that these systems are equipped with the right tools to address these various needs. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but that poses a challenge when you need to drive a screw. I likewise, uh, persuade, uh, likewise, pretending that throwing more taxpayer dollar infrastructure needs will fix the problems alone without knowing what the actual needs are, uh, where they are, and how they will be most effectively addressed will only get us so far. That is why this committee must ensure that we provide the right tools in the drinking water and wastewater infrastructure toolbox, and I think we are well on our way to building on last year Congress's good work. So I'm committed to working on these issues that are so important to me, the citizens of the state of West Virginia, and my fellow committee members. I know these issues are important to my friends on the other side of the aisle, and I have no doubt we will continue to work hard together to address these critical challenges. There are many priorities where we share common ground, and this certainly is one of them. I look forward to our continued partnership in this area and to roll up our sleeves uh, to tell on behalf of the nation that rely on us to ensure the safety and reliability and availability of drinking water and wastewater service. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, as you're bumping along there. And uh, I will now recognize the chairman of the Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife Subcommittee, Senator Duckworth, for an opening statement. Thank you so much, Ranking Member Capito. Mm -hmm. Yes, I hope he gets off the train before it turns around and goes back to <laughs> <laughs> Delaware. Although missing the hearing because of St. Patrick's Day Mass is an acceptable <laughs> excuse uh, for me as a senator from Illinois. I would never be able to show my face back in Chicago. Uh, were I not to accept that excuse. And I would like to start by just giving everyone an Irish blessing, because you can tell from looking at me that my ancestry begins in Ireland. <laughs> um, may the blessings of each day be the blessings that you need the most. Thank you for holding today's joint hearing, Chairman Carper, uh, with the Subcommittee on Water. Today, we will discuss one of the most critical issues for communities in Illinois and throughout the nation, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. When discussing this topic, I am reminded of a moment that still haunts me to this day at a House Oversight Committee hearing on the Flint water crisis a few years back. At the time, my baby girl, my older daughter, was just a year old, and I remember looking out into the audience that was filled with residents of Flint, Michigan, who had gotten on buses and rode all the way to Washington, D.C. because they wanted their voices heard. It was a sea of faces in that hearing room. And at the very back, I couldn't see her face, but I could see her hand. And it was a woman's hand holding up a little baby bottle that had a pink top on it, and it was the exact same bottle that I used to feed my daughter, except that in this baby bottle, the water was brown. And I remember thinking, what if I had had to drink this water while I was pregnant? What if that was the only water that I had to make the formula for my baby? And that is really the beginning of my advocacy for water. What the community in Flint faced was unacceptable, and it is unthinkable that so many other communities in this country have similar stories or face similar threats. The danger is particularly elevated for my home state of Illinois, which by one estimate may be home to nearly 25% of all existing lead service lines in the entire United States. The city of Chicago alone is estimated to have roughly 400,000 lead service lines, that is more than any other city in the nation. This dynamic underlies why strengthening programs and investments under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act have been and remain one of my top priorities in the Senate. While contaminated drinking water has received more attention in recent years, rundown wastewater infrastructure also threatens our health and our homes. For example, the town of Centerville, Illinois has horrible flooding and sewage overflows due to outdated water infrastructure. Can you imagine living your life fearful of sewage overflowing into your home daily? How about celebrating Christmas with toilet paper in your front yard because the sewer system has backed up yet once again? Every American has a right to clean water, no matter their zip code, the color of their skin, or the size of their income. Investing in projects that put Americans back to work locally to build better water infrastructure is how we will make that right a reality. 
Of course, it will take time given where we are starting from. Despite the growing need for investments in water infrastructure, the federal government's share of capital spending in the water sector actually fell by 63% in 1977 to a meager 9% in 2017. And this pattern must end. Federal, state, and local governments must all chip in and pay their fair share so that one day, every American can be confident in the water that flows from their taps and from their drinking fountains in their children's schools. We must increase federal investments in EPA water and wastewater infrastructure programs in order to modernize our systems. Making systems more efficient, more affordable, and more resilient for generations to come must be a priority. That is why I'm working with Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito on a comp comprehensive drinking water and wastewater infrastructure bill. This bill will need to increase funding in critical federal programs, including the state revolving loan funds, WIFIA, lead reduction grants, sewer overflow control grants, and many other critical initiatives. I will push for this bill to increase technical assistance funding and create programs or modify existing programs that have lower non-federal cost shares. I will work to increase grants rather than loans so that all communities can receive assistance in protecting their families and not just those that can afford it. As the witnesses will testify today, the need is real and the time is now to address the water infrastructure in this country. From permanent brain damage to overflowing sewage to costly service interruptions, our constituents are now experiencing the harms that result from allowing our drinking water and wastewater systems to age into a state of disrepair. Our nation must be willing to invest hundreds of billions of dollars over multiple decades to provide every family access to the most basic human need, clean water. Modernizing and upgrading water infrastructure must be at the heart of the ongoing Build Back Better efforts, for nothing will be better if we only fix our roads but fail to repair and upgrade the pipes beneath them. As subcommittee chair, I look forward to working with my rank our ranking member, Lummis, um, to getting a bill to President Biden's desk and to kickstarting a national effort towards a long-term goal of providing families in Illinois and across our nation clean, safe, and reliable water. Thank you, Chairman Carper, for making this a priority for the committee because it absolutely is a priority for me and my home state. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. And now I will recognize the ranking member of that subcommittee, uh, Senator Lummis from Wyoming. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks, Chairman Carper, he'll be here, I believe, in the flesh soon, uh, and Ranking Member Capito. So nice to be with you this morning. Thanks for convening this hearing. Uh, we welcome our witnesses. Thanks for taking the time to share your views on SRF and water infrastructure with us this morning. And I'm so pleased to be working with Senator Duckworth. Uh, we served together in the House, uh, enjoyed each other's company then. I'm sure we will now. Uh, the Lummis family during the century of the 1800s were at Quincy, Illinois. That was where the family homestead was. Uh, and at Quincy, Illinois, uh, they had a triage hospital during the Civil War. Uh, and the, they would bring the uh, wounded uh, up the river or down the river, in wh whichever case it was, to, to Quincy. And uh, uh, that was where the, the family ranch was. We ended up moving farther west. Uh, later on, uh, but uh, uh, it's nice to be with you again. Uh, so, so pleased to uh, be working with you. Um, I'm confident uh, that this will be the continuation of a productive relationship in Congress as we work together on the important items found in our subcommittee jurisdiction, including topics of drinking water and wastewater infrastructure before us today proper oversight of the federal government and its myriad of programs is one of the fundamental duties of Congress. So I'm hopeful this will be just the first of many oversight hearings in our committee. Access to clean and safe drinking water, especially during these challenging times, is critical to both public health and restoring our economy. The primary mechanism for financing water infrastructure is from state and local sources, including the collection of user fees, but funding has not kept pace with the growing need to address an aging system. Only 20% of very large utilities and 10% of small utilities report that they will be able to provide full cost service in five years. The EPA's Clean Water State Revolving Fund and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, or SRFs, 
complement these funding efforts and, and do it in a very responsible way. When I was uh, state treasurer, I served on the uh, State Loan and Investment Board. We administered the state revolving funds. Uh, and so the, in the states, they have tremendous oversight uh, and the capability of then leveraging further projects, which I think is uh, the ideal way for the federal government to distribute funding. Most of our nation's drinking water and wastewater utilities are small. Over 90% of the country's roughly 50,000 community water systems serve populations fewer than 10,000 people. Roughly 80% of America's 17,000 wastewater utilities serve populations fewer than 10,000 people. Rural and small communities, like many found in my state of Wyoming, have greater difficulty affording public wastewater service due to low population density and lack of economies of scale. Rural communities also have lower average median household incomes and often have higher rates of poverty, only compounding the challenge. It follows then that rural water and wastewater services have a more difficult time complying with Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act regulations and permits. You've mentioned, Senator Duckworth, that this is an issue in your state of Illinois as well. Uh, large communities often have extensive teams of experts, including highly trained operators, engineers, and chemists, while smaller communities face the regulatory burdens of the same complex systems, albeit smaller in scale. They often have only one operator doing multiple jobs. This is very typical in my state. These factors reinforce the need for increased flexibility and relief for these communities. This past week, Wyoming faced some challenging weather. Um, I missed two days here because I couldn't make it back. Uh, I couldn't even get to uh, my house on the ranch in uh, Cheyenne had to stay in town, dig out just to get to the streets. We had between 31 and 55 inches of snow, uh, and uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was tremendous. Uh, Mark Pepper, the executive director of the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems, shared with my office some of the work he and his team had to do to make sure water continued to flow to our residents during this storm. One of his recent emails to one of my staffers reads as follows. Again, sorry for the delay, we've been working on a system that had a tank mixer, which circulates water to prevent ice or freeze buildup, experience a power failure on a 300,000 gallon tank on a 100 foot pedestal. I am finally starting to unthaw. We had to take the tank offline and switch to using pumps to supply water to residents. Fortunately, no water quality or quantity issues or EPA Safe Drinking Water Act actions, but now, for now, but the tank damage is such that it will be a few days to make repairs sufficient to come back online and fix it permanently. We had to drain the tank by breaking through the ice shield, use a submersible heat pump to get the flow going, and then get it drained to inspect the damage. Did all this while 100 feet off the ground, harnessed and tethered, to the tank. By the way, he wanted everybody to know that he did it in a completely OSHA compliant way. <laughs> so this is just one small example of the work rural water systems are doing in challenging conditions. I appreciate the work that Mark and others do, particularly in our small and rural communities, to keep our water supply secure. I'm anxious to learn from our witnesses how these EPA water programs can be improved to make the job of our providers and servicers even easier. So uh, welcome back in the flesh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and we appreciated your remarks while you were still on the train. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. A lovely morning. Today is St. Patrick's Day. The luck of the Irish. <laughs> and on this day, Joe Biden decided to go be back in Delaware and attend Mass at St. Patrick's uh, uh, Cathedral, and which is right on my way to the train station. And the city of Wilmington police, I think every police officer and police car in Wilmington was literally on the streets of Wilmington, blocking traffic everywhere, including to the train station. <laughs> so I should have stopped and had Mass. But uh, Jim, Jim and I, Jim Minhoff and I, uh, go to Bible study with a bunch of uh, our colleagues, Democrat and Republican colleagues, most Thursdays. And uh, a week or two ago, uh, Barry Black, our chaplain, 
said these words to us. He says, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And in this case, the window was a Zoom. And it actually works on a train, which I had no idea. So I can just stop coming to hearings. We'll just do it on a train. And, uh, but uh, the luck of the Irish, it worked. And uh, happy to be here with all of you. Apologize. I hope you late. weren't on the quiet car, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry? I hope you were not on the quiet car. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> I was not. I went all the way to the front car, the front car. And there weren't many people up there. So I had perfect quiet. And, uh, and it worked. So yeah. thank you all for uh, holding everybody together. Um, and uh, Senator Capito, thank you for your statement. And uh, Senator Duckworth and Senator Lummis also for, for, uh, for years. We're now going to move to our, our witnesses. And I want to thank uh, Keisha Powell for joining us uh, this morning. Ms. Powell is the Chief uh, Operating Officer of D.C. Water and uh, Vice President of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. And we appreciate you taking the time to join us uh, today. Uh, Senator Enoff, I believe uh, you would like to uh, introduce uh, Shelley. Uh, Chard, is that right? Charlie Chard, who hails from Oklahoma. And uh, take it away, please. Thank That's you. right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm real proud to have Shelly Chard here. She's a 1992 graduate of the University of Oklahoma, bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and biotechnology. She has 29 years of experience implementing the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, comparable state statutes and operator certificate programs. She served as an officer for and on the board of directors of like uh, organizations like Water Environment Federation, Association of Clean Water Administrators, Association of State uh, Drinking Water Administrators, Groundwater Protection, and many, many others. Now, uh, Shelley, in case this sounds familiar to you, this introduction, this is exactly the introduction I gave you 10 years ago, and uh, uh, in, in using the, the, the same words. And at that time, and that was a big issue, uh, Republicans were a minority. That was the, during the Obama administration. And of course, there was a tendency to try to get things more toward the federal government. At that time, the big issue of the day among the, the ag community was the WOTUS bill. It was trying to get the regulation from the states to the federal government, something that we disagreed with. You did a great job at that time uh, witnessing, and I'm sure you will do the same thing today. So since that time, you've gone on to become president of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators and the Association of Clean Water Administrators. You're an incredible lifeline Oklahoman, lifelong Oklahoman, and have worked tirelessly to find creative ways to implement our federal and state water programs. And it's safe to say that you probably know more about this than anyone up here at this table. So uh, we welcome you to testify today. That, and that's damning with faint praise, so <laughs> for, for the record. <laughs> no, actually, we've learned a few things over the, over the years. And Shelly, we thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thank you, Senator Inhofe, for, uh, for introducing uh, her. Um, next, let me uh, uh, recognize again Senator Capito, who's going to introduce another of our witnesses, General Manager of the Utility Board in Morgantown, West Virginia. Thank you, Senator Carper, and the, the two Shelleys. That's I'm, I'm getting mixed up here. I don't know uh, which Shelley we're talking about. You never with, have but, enough. So I'm glad to have another Shelley, yeah. Oh, I'm really happy that Mike McNulty's here. He is, uh, we are very good friends, and he has more than 30 years of experience in West Virginia's water industry. He's, cer he's currently now the general manager of the Morgantown Utility Board in West Virginia. He's been there since October of 2020. He started his career at the Public Service Commission in West Virginia and then went to the Logan County Public Service District. In 2001, he moved to the West Virginia Rural Water Association, where I had uh, a lot of, as we all do, talk to our rural water associations on their visits when they used to come. So I miss, I miss seeing Mike. In person, he was the uh, executive director there, and then he spent time as uh, the general manager of the Putnam County Public Service District, which is actually a regional district. Um, Mike is not a stranger to this committee, much like uh, uh, Senator Anahoff's witness. During his time at the Public Service Commission uh, or Public Service District in Putnam, he uh, appeared before this uh, Water and Wildlife Subcommittee to discuss the Elk River chemical spill. Uh, that left 300,000 people in southern West Virginia, of which I was one, without clean water for several days, and actually some people for several weeks. He has a Master of Public Service, or Service, excuse me, Master of Science in Public Administration from Marshall, 
and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from West Virginia University Institute of Technology. So Mike, thank you for joining us here today. He'll give us some great insights and thank you for the opportunity to introduce him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Marshall, did you say Marshall? Marshall. Marshall. We are Marshall. We are Marshall. We are Marshall. My sister is a graduate of there and my, the bursar there, our assistant bursar is my cousin. Oh. Um, yeah, Bob Collier. And uh, so we, uh, we love Marshall. And uh, Michael, uh, welcome. Uh, we have a couple of Michael McNulty's in, uh, in Delaware as well. So whichever one you are, maybe you're related to one of ours, you never know. But thank you uh, very much for joining us. And uh, Senator Capito, thank you for, for introducing uh, him. Uh, next, uh, I want to uh, welcome Nathan O. Hope I got your name right, Nathan O-H-L-E, Nathan O. Uh, like old friend, that sort of thing. But the Chief Executive Officer of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership, uh, Mr. O. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And uh, uh, I think with that, I think we can go to our, our, our statements. Is that correct? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And to lead off, we're going to lead off with Ms. Powell. And we'll start with you. Uh, you'll be recognized for roughly five minutes. And uh, if uh, you, uh, then we'll have some, we'll have to hear from the other witnesses and then we'll ask uh, some questions. But uh, you're a leadoff hitter and uh, batter up. Go ahead. Play ball. Thanks. Welcome. Good morning and thank you, Chairman Carper. Ranking Member Capito and all members of the committee for the invitation to testify before you on the urgent and growing need for increased federal investment in water infrastructure. My name is Keisha Powell and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of DC Water, responsible for providing drinking water and wastewater services to over 672,000 residents, schools and businesses across Washington, DC and wastewater treatment service for 1.6 million people in neighboring counties of Maryland and Virginia. Serving as Vice President of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, or NACWA, I'm honored to testify on behalf of NACWA and more than 330 public clean water utilities we represent nationwide. For over 50 years, NACWA has represented publicly owned clean water utilities whose mission is to ensure that the communities they serve have access to safe, reliable, and affordable clean water services while also ensuring the highest level of public health and environmental protections. As part of that mission, NACWA has long advocated for the federal government to recommit to a full and long-term partnership with local communities to invest in and build critical water infrastructure. I bring a clear message today. Now more than ever, the nation's public clean water utilities need a significant increase in federal clean water investment. The current federal share of water infrastructure funding nationwide is less than 5%, leaving our ratepayers to cover 95% of the financial burden. In my time as the Public Works Director for Jackson, Mississippi, I recall finding it unacceptable that we could fill potholes with grant funding, but we were forced to take out an emergency loan to address a public health issue when the lead action level was exceeded. Public clean water utilities are at a tipping point, already faced with the challenge of maintaining and replacing aging infrastructure, grappling with the impacts of climate change on our most vulnerable communities, and spending billions to meet our compliance obligations the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the financial strain for many clean water utilities as arrearages have grown to an estimated 8.7 billion in revenue losses. Like DC Water, most utilities have raised rates for years to meet the compliance obligations of the Federal Clean Water and Safe Drinking Water Acts. It must be recognized that if it is important for the federal government to regulate, it is equally important to provide funding to meet these increasingly stringent requirements. For the burden from this disparity is often borne by households of color and contributes to an increasingly acute environmental justice challenge. For several years, DC Water has been at the forefront of meeting these challenges. Even as the income gap widens among our ratepayers, we are still investing in needed upgrades to our aging infrastructure to achieve intergenerational equity and meet our compliance obligations. At the heart of these efforts is the authority's DC Clean Rivers program, a 2.7 billion infrastructure program designed to capture and clean wastewater during rainfalls before it ever reaches local waterways. The program's investments are on track to deliver a 96% reduction in system-wide combined sewer overflow volume, 1 million pounds of nitrogen reduction to the Chesapeake Bay, 
and an economic impact of 41,850 jobs over the life of the, of the program, to name a few benefits. NACWA believes that increased funding for key existing federal programs like the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, Sewer Overflow and Stormwater Reuse Municipal Grants, and WIFIA is critically important. NACWA calls on Congress to provide a substantial amount of funding for the water sector, at least on par with other essential infrastructure sectors in any upcoming infrastructure package, and to make more funding available as grants. NACWA also urges establishment of a permanent federal low-income water assistance program to aid vulnerable households in paying for water and wastewater services more affordably. We appreciate the initial funding of this program through the COVID-19 relief packages, but more must be done to ensure that grandmothers on a fixed income, single parent households struggling to make ends meet, or the family who has now seen a recent job loss due to the pandemic are not forced to choose between safe drinking water and clean water services or staying in their home. As our country looks to rebound from the pandemic, put people to work and build stronger, healthier communities. NACWA calls on Congress to make a strong commitment to reinvesting in water infrastructure. Congress has an opportunity to turn a generational problem into a multi-generational solution. This concludes my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. All right, uh, Ms. Bell, thanks for, uh, for that opening statement. And uh, next is Ms. Jordan. Uh, you recognize at this time, please proceed. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, Subcommittee Chairwoman Duckworth, and Subcommittee Ranking Member Lummis, and all members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you and discuss how we can best address the protection of public health through increased infrastructure funding and through the collaborative partnerships among the states, tribes, territories, and the federal government in implementing water programs. My name is Shelley Chard, and I am the current past president of the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, whose 57 members include the 50 states, five territorial programs, the District of Columbia, and the Navajo Nation. Our members have primary authority for implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act and are on the front lines every day providing technical assistance, support, and oversight of drinking water systems, which are, in, are critically important to ensure safe drinking water and protecting public health in our country. Also, I am the Water Quality Division Director at the Oklahoma Department of Environmental Quality, where I oversee the drinking water, wastewater, stormwater operator certification and training programs and water reuse programs. Additionally, I serve on the Board of Trustees for the Water Environment Federation, the Board of Directors for Groundwater Protection Council, the National Drinking Water Advisory Council, and have previously served as the President of the Association of Safe Drinking Water Administrators. Today, I will address ASTWA's perspective on challenges facing drinking water and my own experiences on the challenges of facing drinking water and wastewater infrastructure. If there's anything we've learned this past year, and it's really a relearning of what we've always known, and that is water is life. The provision of safe water is essential to protecting public health and as we continue to fight the COVID pandemic, serving as a stark reminder of how vulnerable people without access to clean water are to COVID and other illnesses. In the wake of this public health crisis, many systems halted water shutoffs for non-payment as customers struggled to pay their bills amid significant unemployment across the country. These decisions, which were made in the best interest of public health, have <coughs> real financial impacts. And in California alone, it is estimated that there are 1.6 million households with a combined water debt of around a million of a billion dollars with a B <clears throat> due to the pandemic. Water systems are still bearing the cost to treat and deliver safe water without being able to recuperate their costs. The devastating February winter storm that plunged much of the US into record-breaking cold weather serves as a reminder of a different kind. Water and wastewater systems must become more resilient to significant weather events and changes in climate. Water and wastewater systems are facing an increasing number of significant weather events, including wildfires, ice storms, flooding, hurricanes, and drought. These systems often operate out of sight and out of mind and only garner attention when there is a failure. The recent winter storm 
showed all of us the very real consequences to these facilities. Building more resilient and adaptable water infrastructure is essential to ensuring safe future. Considering the entire water cycle is important, and it's I really want to emphasize the word cycle. The U.S. bifurcates water management between the Clean Water Act and Safe Drinking Water Act, but it really is all one water. Treatment and wastewater systems impact the water quality of the downstream drinking water, and drinking water treatment impacts wastewater treatment reuse in our surface water bodies. It's critical that we have a strong federal funding through drinking water and clean water state revolving funds and continue to emphasize at the federal, state, and local level the importance of holistic water management. As states and water programs prepare for the new lead and copper rule, take on PFAS sampling and treatment, upgrade cybersecurity, and work toward resiliency, there's one piece of infrastructure that is often forgotten, and that is the human infrastructure that it takes to provide safe water. The water sector is facing substantial workforce replacement needs at every level. The aging workforce and high rate of retirement in the sector are placing pressures on utilities to find the next generation of workers. This means more training is needed for water system operators and managers, as well as state and federal regulators. These training programs through community colleges, vocational schools, correctional facilities, and apprenticeship programs in coordination with the Department of Commerce are helping to bridge this gap, but funding is needed. Ultimately, increased federal funds through existing programs like the SRF and the state and tribal assistance grants, which funds water programs are needed to protect public health. State programs and water and wastewater systems are struggling to meet the challenges we are now facing, including changing weather patterns resulting in extreme events, aging infrastructure, increased federal regulatory standards, and addressing unregulated contaminants. Without continued federal funding for states and water and wastewater systems, we will all continue to struggle with public health. Thank you for the opportunity to be here before you today, and I look forward to the continued dialogue and the importance of infrastructure funding. Thank you. Ms. Chard, can you hear me? Sure. Ms. Chard, can you hear me? Yes. yes, sir. Yeah. Where are you this morning? Good, thank you. <laughs> no, where, where, where? Oh, I'm in Oklahoma City at my office. Oklahoma City, fair enough. Thank you. All righty. Jim, thanks for, uh, for introducing her the second time. You said the last time was 10 years ago? The last time I was before this committee was 10 years ago. All right. When she was, what, 21? <laughs> Okay. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right, Michael McNulty, are you out there somewhere? And maybe even in Morgantown? Where are you, Michael? Hi, good morning. Uh, yes, I'm in Morgantown this morning. Morning, Morgantown. That's a great And song. I was in Beckley over song. the weekend. We're in Beckley, my natives. My, 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 where I was born, that's great. It's like a home game. Well, thank you for joining us, Michael. Good to, good to hear from you. Take it away. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss our nation's water and wastewater utilities. From the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been three primary messages, wear a mask, social distance, and wash your hands. I respectfully draw your attention to the last part, wash your hands. Thanks to the work of trained operators at more than 148,000 active water systems across this great country of ours, safe, reliable water is available. And thanks to our nation's more than 16,000 publicly owned wastewater treatment systems, the 82 gallons of water each American uses a day is safely treated. And thanks to tens of thousands of maintenance staff, it is re reliably transported. The fact is our nation's water and wastewater professionals are so efficient, they're easy to overlook. When people turn on a faucet, safe water flows. When they flush a toilet, the waste is removed and treated. Not a second thought is given to how these systems work. However, beneath the surface of all this wonderfully orchestrated engineering and science, an unseen crisis brews. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers 2021 report card on America's infrastructure, utilities were replacing on average one half of 1% of H water pipes per year in 2015. By 2019, this percentage increased to as much as 4.8%, a reflection of aging infrastructure. The same applies to the sewer side. 
where much of the wastewater infrastructure was constructed in the 1970s with passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972. When constructed, the lifespan of these systems was 40 to 50 years. Today, we're at the end of that lifespan and the systems are in need of upgrading. On top of this, we have increasingly stringent regulatory compliance obligations. Although I'm not here to discuss this specifically, increased regulation results in increased compliance costs. These are very real dollars that ratepayers must bear. When combined with required upgrades, investments in raw water protection, and enhanced raw and treated water monitoring, the pressure on ratepayers intensifies. Affordability, especially among vulnerable populations, is a very real issue. This is certainly true given the financial ramifications of the pandemic. Then there's the fact that 50% of the workforce within our industry will retire in the coming decade. This is something we're very much aware of at Morgantown Utility Board. Within the last month, we have lost more than 150 years of experience due to retirement with more on the way. Going back 12 months, we've easily lost more than 300 years of experience. While these challenges apply to all sizes of water and sewer utilities, they are particularly relevant to rural systems. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, just 9% of all community water systems serve over 257 million people, while the bulk of community systems serve communities with populations under 10,000. The utilities not only struggle to maintain their systems, but have fewer customers per mile of pipeline to share costs. We see this in West Virginia, where some communities have been without safe drinking water for years, while others struggle to provide waste disposal. If you're looking for answers, I can tell you that the complex array of funding mechanisms that exist will not solve the problem. For example, expending funds to improve a system that lacks professionally trained support staff is not a long-term solution. Yes, we do need extremely low cost to no interest loans, grants, and even debt forgiveness to upgrade our water and wastewater infrastructure, but we also need direct grants to recruit, train, and retain professional level staff. To encourage, encourage the merger of smaller systems to better share costs, we need incentives rather than heavy handed regulations. Rural utilities need ability to apply funds to meet their unique set of circumstances and not a one size fits all approach. Certainly, we can all agree that no child should go thirsty or unbathed because a parent cannot afford the water or sewer bill. We can all agree that no senior citizen should have to choose between buying their medications or paying a utility bill. Excuse me. And we can all agree that no American should turn on a faucet and wonder if the water coming out of it is safe. Again, thank you for your time and for addressing this very important issue. Michael, thanks, uh, so, thanks so much. Uh, great, to, great to see and hear from you. Uh, next is a, uh, our fourth, with, fourth and I think final witnesses. I've already mispronounced your name at once, and it's Miss, uh, Mr. O. So now I have <coughs> my staff, it's Oli. How do you really pronounce your name? That's correct, it's Oli. All right. Has your name ever been mispronounced? All the time. <laughs> well, I promise never to mispronounce it again. How's that? Well, Mr. Oli, no, we're thrilled that you've joined us. And uh, we, uh, so I apologize for mangling your name. We'll not do it again. Please proceed, and then we'll have some questions. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, Subcommittee Chair Duckworth, Subcommittee Ranking Member Lummis and members of the committee for this opportunity to address the needs of water systems in small, rural, and tribal communities. My name is Nathan Oley, and I'm the CEO of the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. RCAP is a national network of nonprofit partners working to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to rural and tribal communities in every state, territory, and on tribal lands. Through our regional partners, more than 300 technical assistance providers build capacity that leads to sustainable and resilient water and wastewater systems. Our approach is grounded in long-term trusted relationship with the thousands of rural and tribal communities across the country. Last year, RCAP served more than 3.4 million rural and tribal residents in more than 2,000 of the smallest, most distressed communities across the country. The average population of the communities we served was 1,500, with the median household income of half the national average. We served more than 40% of America's persistent poverty counties and almost 300,000 individuals from indigenous communities. In addition, with people of color representing 21% of the rural population, 
and 83% of rural population growth, we support a rural America that is increasingly diverse. The talent, innovation, and resiliency of America's rural areas will play a central role in the future of the U.S. economy. Water is a driving factor for economic growth. Of the approximately 150,000 public water systems across the country, 97% serve communities of 10,000 or less, and 72% serve communities of 500 or less. COVID-19 has further exacerbated the challenges rural communities face, as they had not yet fully recovered from the 2008 recession. To better understand the pandemic's impact on rural and tribal systems, RCAP conducted a survey in May of 2020. The responses we received were startling. More than 31% of systems estimated they would not be able to continue to cover all costs for more than six months due to an estimated revenue loss of between 3.6 and 5.5 billion for small systems. Perhaps even more alarming, more than 43% of systems surveyed said they rely on one full-time operator or less, leaving many communities at risk if their operator fell ill. With these mounting financial losses, many communities were forced to defer infrastructure projects, adding to the more than $1 trillion in needed updates for the water sector over the next 25 years, according to EPA. This burden largely falls on communities. Federal funding for water infrastructure is a paltry 3.5% of annual investment in the sector, down from 63% 50 years ago. Funding is incredibly important, but in small communities, it is not enough. Technical assistance is needed to build and strengthen local capacity to take on these challenges. The recent work of the committee has been extremely beneficial to the communities we serve. Last Congress, EPW produced two drinking water and wastewater infrastructure bills, DEWEA 2020 and AWEA 2020, which included several important policies. DEWEA 2020 reauthorized a program that allows for up to 2% of the drinking water SRFs for TA and extended TA to EPA's Small and Disadvantaged Communities Grant Program. DEWEA 2020 also extended the EPA's National Priority Area Technical Assistance Program to communities that are facing an imminent threat to public health and allowed nonprofits like RCAP to provide TA to schools and childcare facilities to ensure that water is safe for every child. One major unexpected emergency can leave small utilities financially distressed. With a small base of ratepayers, loans may not work for these communities. DEWEA 2020 requires states to use 20% of the drinking water SRFs for grants, negative interest loans, or to refinance debt. OEA 2020 also included several TA provisions creating circuit rider programs to assist small systems and grant programs to improve efficiencies at small utilities and to address emergency response plans and risk and resiliency assessments. Some people in rural communities are not connected to any wastewater system, resulting in raw sewage in yards and waterways, contaminated drinking water for residents, and chronic debilitating diseases like hookworm. Challenges like this can trap people in a vicious cycle of poverty. I want to thank Senators Capito, Booker, and former Senator Jones for the introduction of a bill that will create a grant program to address these challenges, and I commend the committee for including it in OEA 2020. Finally, one priority for rural communities did not make it into DEWEA or OEA, the creation of a low-income water customer assistance program. According to most recent estimates, the non-metro poverty rate was 16.1%, much higher than in metro areas. Further, counties experiencing long-term poverty are almost exclusively rural. We have assistance programs for low-income Americans for food, shelter, heat, and health care. There is no such program for water. I thank Senators Cardin and Wicker for introducing bipartisan and bicameral legislation last Congress that would pilot such a program and urge the committee to create a program to solve this problem once and for all. RCAP works with communities and partners across the country to advocate for and generate economic opportunities for rural areas. The services provided through these programs deliver critical assistance in the small and disadvantaged communities where it is most needed. I thank the committee for inviting me to testify today, and I look forward to working with you and your colleagues to ensure these important priorities are passed into law. Thank you. Mr. Oley, thanks, uh, thanks so much for batting cleanup for us. And uh, uh, my staff's just given me, uh, Senator Capote just given me a list of uh, um, order for questioning. I'm uh, listed first, and I'm going to yield to, to you, and I'll, I'll ask questions later. Uh, Senator Duckworth is next. Senator Lummis is next. Ben Cardin, I think, is going to join us by Web WebEx. And Senator Inhofe, I think, is going to take the handoff from uh, Senator Capito. And uh, also joining us by WebEx, uh, Senator Stavanoff. It's, it's a brave new world in terms of hearings, isn't it? All right, Senator Capito, you want to yield to this yes. guy from Oklahoma? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield uh, my first place here, at, uh, or second place, to Senator Inhofe. Well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. And something happened that was, it doesn't happen very often. I want to compliment you and and uh, Ms. Capito, on the fact that we had witnesses, all were really well-informed well and well-qualified. 
but they all, each one, stayed within five minutes. That never happens. And I just appreciate that very, very much. Um, Ms. Chard, in your testimony, you note how the EPA should, and I emphasize should, consider the size of water systems when establishing regulations. The reality is that additional regulations only create uh, often uh, unsustainable burdens on our small rural and uh, disadvantaged systems as a result of financial limitations in geography. So, Ms. Chard, should national regulations take into account the varying capabilities of the water systems, and are they doing that now? So, thank you, Senator Inhofe. Uh, that's a tough one for all of us. Um, we don't want to establish a two or three tier uh, protection level, the haves and the have nots. Um, but we do have to recognize that uh, small systems have a different capacity to comply. Uh, we have seen with the uh, disinfection byproducts rule, there was uh, stage one, which applied to the larger systems and then brought in the smaller systems in stage two. Uh, that gave the smaller systems additional time uh, to develop the expertise to obtain funding to try to install technologies. Uh, but it's really important that we look at the development of cost-effective and efficient technologies uh, that small systems can, one, afford, but two, have the technical capabilities to operate. We need to make sure that we are providing appropriate workforce training and technical assistance training and sampling assistance training for uh, these smaller, often very rural systems. We talk about the benefits of other programs where we can come in through capacity development uh, and work with those systems on their technical, financial, and managerial capabilities. Uh, those take lesser funds um, to actually implement uh, but anytime we see expanding uh, regulatory provisions, we have to recognize that there are going to be struggles for small systems um, in order to comply, not only the cost, but on the uh, technical capabilities as well. So you think there is room for improvement? Oh, I definitely think there's room for improvement in the regulations. As somebody who's involved in writing them, I know we can do better. There's definitely room for improvement in operations. Um, we can help systems uh, get better trained. Uh, we can definitely improve the amount of funding that we dedicate to small systems. Um, in Oklahoma, we're very fortunate that we're able to work with our tribal partners and other uh, non-traditional partners in solving region-wide uh, drinking water and wastewater programs well, and on, problems. On, on, on regulations, I agree with you. There are some problems. Uh, I remember last March, in response to the coronavirus pandemic, states issued stay-at-home orders and distance guidelines and all the guidelines that we are, are so familiar with now. Um, and during that time, the uh, uh, last March, due to the coronavirus, the EPA announced it temporarily, and I stress temporarily because that's what they did. They relaxed the certain penalties for noncompliance of routine environmental reporting and monitored requirements. Uh, and because of that, Gina uh, McCarthy, who's now the President um, Biden's domestic climate czar, called the move an open license to pollute. Now, I don't think it did, and uh, we, maybe we learned some lessons from that action. And I'd like to get your response to, uh, did you observe any increased water pollution in Oklahoma as a result of relaxing uh, some of these uh, regulations? Um, in Oklahoma, the answer is a resounding no, we did not. Um, the state actually took a similar action prior to the EPA action. And really what it did was not change compliance and not change requirements. It just added a mitigating factor that could be considered if a penalty were assessed. In Oklahoma, we had four or five requests uh, for mitigation or to consider COVID-19 because of a violation. 
but the violations were not uh, actually uh, permit limit violations or national drinking water standard violations. It was uh, samples were not analyzed within the holding time or were not collected in time. And that was a result mm -hmm. of people being ill and being unable to uh, collect those samples or in many cases outside the systems control. Um, it was at a laboratory facility. And so we were able to work with those systems and we did not see uh, significant issues. Yeah, I, related and I to remember that. making some phone calls at that time and observing that we did a good, by and large, states do a great job of regulation. That's a good point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you bet. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for asking those questions. And uh, Senator Capito, thank you for yielding. Uh, I think we're going to uh, bounce over to Senator Duckworth next. And thank you for your leadership on these issues and for leading a subcommittee that has jurisdiction over many of them. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question is for all the witnesses. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many people experienced total water shutoff as they struggled to pay the bills. To protect families during a deadly, deadly public health crisis, Illinois and other states took the lead in implementing shutoff moratoriums to prevent water utilities from shutting off water service. This action was, was absolutely essential in protecting households in the near term. However, over the long term, additional action will be required to protect consumers from sharp rate hikes down the road and to ensure water systems have sufficient capital for modernization projects. Now, I don't want to downplay the magnitude of the challenges that we face. The total water debt resulting from the pandemic easily exceeds a billion dollars nationwide. However, I'm confident that our nation can avert a national water debt crisis if we start taking action now. As every witness is familiar with the daunting challenge of balancing water affordability and upgrades, my question is for the entire panel. What actions should we take at the federal, state, and local levels to protect consumers while also ensuring utilities have sufficient capital to make long-term investments in water systems infrastructure? And perhaps you can or, um, answer in the order that you uh, made your statements. Thank you. Thank you for, for the question, Senator Duckworth. I, I do want to start out by saying that um, I started uh, when the pandemic was declared. I was commissioner in Atlanta uh, and then transitioned to DC Water uh, in, in May. Uh, and in both cases, we not only uh, uh, stopped shutting off water, but we reconnected uh, customers that were in shut off status at DC Water, uh, re restoring service to more than 300 customers. Uh, to your question, I think. Um, what we are trying to do, uh, specifically at DC Water, is make sure that all of our customers who have fallen into arrears are connected with every dollar of assistance that is available. That includes assistance under our customer assistance programs. We've just developed a new customer assistance program that is designed to help renters and multifamily uh, 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 units, uh, and we're looking to develop another. Uh, and then we'll be taking advantage of the funding that was included in the COVID relief package for uh, that will flow through HHS uh, to provide uh, some funding assistance as well. And I just think that it's very important that not only are, do we have the money, um, particularly through the low income water assistance program, um, and we need to see more funding there. Um, but not only do we have to have money to support uh, customers that fall into arrears, but it's important for us to have funding and more funding in, in terms of grants for the uh, utilities uh, to, to do that critical infrastructure work that you spoke of. Uh, if we don't have uh, more grant funding specifically, then, then uh, we're forced to have to pa pass on a repayment of loans uh, to our ratepayers, which exacerbates the issue that, that they have, the affordability issue they have. Thank you. Ms. Chard? Um, I can't disagree with anything that Ms. Powell had to say. Um, it is a big issue, critically important. I think um, it's vital if we can um, help our systems uh, with recovering these costs, they're still paying to treat water 
um, and deliver water to individuals. Uh, so if we anything that Congress can do to help uh, support those systems, that would be fantastic. Uh, they are accruing debt at a fast rate and they're not able uh, to recover that debt. And then that in turn creates a problem for them in doing routine operation and maintenance and future um, expansion or uh, major construction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Lee, you want to speak to that as well as the grants versus loan from the federal government? Thank you. I would love to. Thank you very much, Senator Duckworth. I think there's two things that we need to do when considering these issues. First and foremost is address those low income individuals and families that can't afford uh, these bills. And so the, the first piece is really that low income assistance program that we've talked about that you've heard several of us mention. There's actually an $8 billion need uh, for that program. And so we've got a great start in putting that program in place, but there's significant additional funding that's needed. There's also a need to help utilities and systems at the same time, just as you heard Ms. Powell talk about. And there was a program called the Emergency Assistance for Rural Water Systems Act uh, that was a potential opportunity to do just that. And what it does is it addresses the O&M, the operations and maintenance costs that systems have been undergoing over the past year that they haven't been able to, to recoup through bills and ratepayers. Uh, and it addresses the long-term needs of these communities and certainly of those utilities, but also then ensures that long-term infrastructure bills uh, aren't a future deficit onto these communities and to those families. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I, Senator Capito uh, is, has another hearing to get to, so she's going to uh, go next, and she will be followed as, uh, I like this, the current order could all, always change. Given today what's happened already, it'll probably change. But Senator Capito followed by Senator Cardin, uh, followed by Senator Roseman, who's here. Welcome, John. And followed by uh, Senator Stabba Webex. So, uh, Senator Capito, uh, go, please pr push. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I I'd like to direct my first question to Mr. McNulty. Uh, in everybody's testimony, it talked about workforce development and the needs of the systems uh, to replenish their workforce. Uh, I worked in 2018 with Senator Booker on this committee to uh, draft and enact our legislation actually establishing a EP, EPA workforce development, um, excuse me, EPA workforce development that is in high demand, I understand. I understand it's oversubscribed. Ms. Powell uh, thanked me here in person, but uh, Mike, if you could, or Mr. McNulty, if you could, what are the chief challenges facing your workforce? Is it retirements, retention, lack of interest, lack of qualified candidates? Can you uh, expound on that for me, please? Pardon me, Senator. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I'm getting used to this uh, new way of uh, me having meetings. Uh, Senator, I think the best answer would be D, all of the above. Uh, retirements are certainly uh, uh, upon us. Uh, it is uh, tough to require uh, to uh, recruit good candidates. Uh, so we're, we, we do struggle with that here, especially in West Virginia. Um, Let's let's not forget that many rural communities are still dealing with the opioid crisis. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to find uh, good qualified candidates that, uh, that that don't have substance abuse uh, issues. Um, so we appreciate all of Congress's work to uh, to help with that problem. But uh, also, uh, you know, we we are working towards here in West Virginia the apprenticeship program. And I think that it's going to be a very successful program. Uh, I know that uh, West Virginia Rural Water is getting that kick started, and we really look forward to the availability of, of bringing young folks in to, uh, to to learn the business and to become qualified operators. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Powell, did you want to uh, speak to that? I, I certainly can, uh, uh, Senator Capito, and I agree with my, my colleague. Um, it is all of the above, and um, you know we have we have to, as a water sector, do a better job about promoting the opportunities that exist to work in the water sector. Um, I think we employ every type of uh, career field uh, there is, from finance to scientists. Uh, to the, the on, boots on the ground workers. Uh, so we have to do a better job of getting the messages out. Um, but we've also, as a water sector, started to pursue um, different means of recruiting uh, uh, talent. 
Um, if the talent doesn't come to you, go out and get it. And that's certainly what we did in Atlanta when we formed a partnership with the Department of Corrections uh, to put uh, folks that were reentering society, uh, fathers, uh, put them to work as watershed trainees who then eventually became full-time employees of the utility. Uh, and we were able to, to do uh, two cohorts. <laughs> we also formed a partnership for youth and we also formed a partnership focused on women who were victims of, of um, uh, trafficking. And so I think those types of programs which are supported by uh, the grant uh, funding program that you championed are important because it's uh, introducing folks that wouldn't otherwise look at the sector to opportunities for uh, uh, good career paths, low barrier to entry jobs, uh, and, and, and stable work with, uh, with, with good wages. Right, thank you. Uh, on the resiliency and data availability, um, well, actually on the data availability, I mentioned in my opening statement that sometimes the data, we wanna pinpoint the help where the need is most, uh, is most apparent. And uh, Mr. McNulty, could you, uh, I'm gonna ask two questions, but you can pick, can you provide your perspective on the best way to ensure that this committee has a working understanding of the current existing challenges and associated needs facing your systems, but also how would you propose that we would improve the data available to EPA, Congress, and other stakeholders to make sure that we are targeting and using that for our policy decisions? I, I believe the, the best way to, to learn about the, the challenges that we're facing is boots on the ground, Senator. Um, I think visits uh, out, out to the utilities are, are critical. I know that you've uh, been all around West Virginia. You've done that. You've, uh, you've, you've been to these communities. You see firsthand. Uh, I think that uh, the more the better in that respect. Uh, and that's how Congress is really going to learn what those needs are. Uh, you know, I can't stress enough when we talk about need, uh, when I m mentioned uh, a moment ago about debt forgiveness, you know, debt is one of the heaviest burdens that utilities face. And, you know, when we talk about the pandemic and, and the uh, uh, shutoffs uh, and, and those revenue drops, uh, you know, the debt services didn't stop. You know, those, those payments were still due. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, again, that if we get out and, 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 and visit and learn and talk to those uh, water and wastewater professionals, that's the best way to, to understand the need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Capito, thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much for holding the fort down until I, uh, I could get here. See you later on the floor. We have a, a vote that's been announced. I think it was going to start about, uh, about 10 minutes. And um, what I'd like to do is... Uh, Go ahead and, and complete uh, hearing from our witnesses and uh, and question and answer period that we're doing now, and uh, in the uh, in the queue we have um, Senator Cardin I think by Webex. Uh, ben is the uh, chairman of the uh, transportation water uh, water transportation infrastructure uh, subcommittee, and he'll be followed by uh, Senator Bozeman and then by Webex by uh, Senator Stapanov. So Senator Cardin, Senator Bozeman, Senator Stapanov, and if no one else has shown up, then I'll ask some questions myself. All right. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, thank you very much. Senator uh, Cardin. Appreciate this hearing. This is critically important. Uh, Mr. Olney, I want to follow up on your point, and thank you for mentioning uh, the legislation that Senator Wicker and I have filed, bipartisan le legislation that deals with affordability. And it's a double-edged problem, because generally in poorer neighborhoods, the rates are just not an option to increase the rate cost in order to deal with the infrastructure needs. Uh, so you have the issue of affordability because of the income level of the person who has to pay the water bill. And then you have the community's capacity in order to do the infrastructure that bring the water up to the quality that's needed. Uh, and then you put on top of that that the WIFIA program and the state revolving fund programs are oversubscribed and additional debt is not always an option because, again, it comes back on the rate system itself. So. Can you uh, just share with us your thoughts? Uh, I appreciate the legislation you refer to as it deals with the consumer, but are there other areas that we can target to aid to deal with economic justice issues for underserved communities so they can get safe drinking water? 
Thank you very much for the question, Senator Cardin, and thank you for continuing to be a consummate champion uh, of these issues. Uh, I think what you hit on is incredibly important. Affordability is a big piece of this puzzle. It can't just be access. And so we've got to think about how do we ensure those most vulnerable populations have access but have affordable access. Things like grants and forgivable loans through the SRF program is a great way to do it, but we also need sustained and intentional investment through those grant and forgivable loan programs. We need to have the federal government play a larger role in financing these systems through those grants and loan programs. And we need to make sure that whether it's EPA or USDA or other funders, that they can find ways to target those most vulnerable populations, those that need it the most for those grants and forgivable loan programs. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I think uh, we, we had a hearing a couple of years ago when the mayor of Baltimore testified before our committee and, and, and raised these issues that we have to look at new ways of trying to provide funding. These existing programs work, but only to a point. As we're talking about building back better, we're talking about being fair to communities, we're talking about economic and environmental justice to communities. I would hope this committee would take a look at opportunities in which we could expand uh, the capacities in underserved communities. It's the same communities that have lead issues that we have to deal with and how are we going to remedy the, the, the lead problems. And uh, Senator Lomas mentioned the challenges in Wyoming and dealing with the weather conditions that she confronted. Well, we have adaptation issues. We have weather climate issues that we have to deal with. You put that all together and so many communities are just not capable of dealing with these issues without uh, a significant transformational change at the national level. So I, I hope as we go through this debate in our committee uh, that uh, our, our experts that are here today can help us in a creative way as to how we can make a consequential difference. The chairman cited and several have cited the current status of water infrastructure in America. It's certainly not at the level. I talk about my own city of Baltimore that had the best water infrastructure in the world. The problem was that was 100 years ago, literally. <laughs> and not too long ago, we found some pipes that were laid 100 years ago, still in use in Baltimore. So it, it really does require our attention at, a, at an effort to, to look at ways that we can make a, a transformational change. And I, I would just hope that you would share those thoughts with the committee. Uh, I know that our chairman and ranking member are, are very much interested in, in, in making a, a major difference. We want to work in a bipartisan manner to get that done. I hope part of that will be the affordability of the customer, the legislation that I've authored with Senator Wicker. Uh, but I think we also have to deal with the realities of how do we deal with adaptation? How do we deal with climate change? How do we deal with uh, getting led out of uh, of our system and providing ways that we can modernize our water infrastructure in this country. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you and other members of our committee on this challenge, and I hope that we can find some creative ways uh, to make a difference uh, in the status of our wastewater and clean water in America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Garden, thanks, uh, thanks, for, thanks for your leadership on the, these issues and other uh, infrastructure issues, and God knows how many others. So thank you, Ben. Um, Senator Lummis, uh, Senator Lummis succeeds uh, Mike Kenzie from uh, Wyoming. I, I think when she got here uh, a couple of months ago, I, I shared with her uh, this story. And um, I was brand new in the Senate. I'm, I was presiding over the Senate. And um, the um, fellow who was out in the audience was uh, Mike Kenzie, got recognized on the Republican side. And he spoke and he ended up talking about why they got so much done on the uh, Health Education Labor Pension Committee, where he was a senior Republican maybe the most, one of the most uh, conservative uh, Republicans in the Senate. And the, the senior Democrat was uh, Ted Kennedy. Yeah. And uh, he uh, spoke about the 80-20 rule, why, uh, why they were able to get so much done on a committee with one of the most liberal Democrats leading and one of the most conservative Republicans leading. And I didn't know what the 80-20 rule was. And I asked one of the pages to, after he finished speaking, to come up to where I was presiding and, and uh, while someone else spoke. And, to explain to me, what is the 80-20 rule? Oh, and he said, the 80-20 rule just goes like this. He said, the reason why Ted Kennedy and I get so much done on the Health Education Labor Pension Committee is because we believe in the 80-20 rule. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, that we agree on 80% of the stuff. We disagree on 20% of the stuff. And we focus on the 80% that we agree on. And one of the great things about this committee, and I told uh, Senator Lemons how happy I am that she chose to be, become a member, is that we abide by the 80-20 rule. We agree about on 80% of the stuff, maybe disagree on the 20%. And we focus on the 80% that we agree on. That's what we're doing this morning with water, wastewater. Uh, and we're, we're doing a similar kind of thing with 
with um, uh, service transportation, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's also stuff that's just hugely important for our country right now. So I almost were delighted you're on the committee. I'm happy to recognize you to speak. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And this is certainly a topic that is probably more than 80% agreement. Uh, these systems are critical to uh, the lives of uh, everyday Americans, to all of us. So uh, this topic is, is both extremely timely and extremely important to the people that we work for here in Washington. So I very much appreciate uh, your choice uh, to lead off with this topic and uh, Senator Duckworth's uh, choice to lead off with this topic. This is, uh, this is very much appreciated by my state of Wyoming. Uh, and I too hope the 80-20 rule will continue to apply during the course of the next couple of years. I, I can assure you that that is my goal as well. Um, my first question is for Mr. Oley. Um, I'm interested in how we can make sure that the monies that are coming from the federal government are getting to on the ground assistance, also technical assistance, uh, and not going to academics or regulators. Because regardless of how many regulations we pass or how many studies there are, uh, what really gets clean water to people uh, are uh, the boots on the ground workers that install and maintain systems and understand how to do it. So, Mr. Oley, how can we make sure that the money that Congress is appropriating uh, for these programs is going directly to boots on the ground uh, working on these systems? Thank, thank you very you much for the, the question, Senator Lummis, and thank you for your continued support. Uh, I think technical assistance programs are the key to all of these programs, to helping communities, especially the most vulnerable communities, access the funding. And so EPA has existing technical assistance programs, ones like We Operate, which fall underneath their national priority areas, but also there's been several new technical assistance programs created. And so ensuring that you're getting qualified uh, nonprofit organizations that are focused on technical assistance that have long-term trusted relationships, that I think is the most critical, especially in small communities, to ensure that you've got folks that have built-in relationships, have the expertise, and then obviously are helping those systems access additional resources across the federal federal government. Mr. McNulty, could you weigh in on this topic as well? Oh, yes, ma'am. I, I, I certainly agree. Uh, I, I believe that the uh, USDA uh, circuit rider program is one of the very best programs in this country and uh, I, I think you're you're on the right track here with uh, with getting it out in technical assistance to the communities have you seen that circuit rider program uh, work regardless of uh, who's uh, in the White House yes I have well uh, then it, it, it's There's always a, a big. Pro it's always a favorite program, I think, of Congress. Well, it's certainly um, reassuring to, uh, to hear you say that. Um, the next question I have is for any one of you who cares to answer. Um, do you have any ideas about creative advancements in water management that are happening, whether it's engineering or financing or otherwise? Uh, that Congress should know about and either play a role in or intentionally not play a role in? Well, I'll, this is Shelley Chart. I'll jump in um, to say Oklahoma has been very successful and we've created what's called the Oklahoma Strategic Alliance. It is made up of our state uh, funding agency uh, it's made up of technical assistance providers and uh, the DEQ drinking water wastewater staff and capacity development trainers. Um, that's a program that's allowed us to work together and we bring together people from all different backgrounds. They can go out and actually provide some of that uh, boots on the ground uh, coordination and collaboration. Uh, between all of the groups, they have somebody they can reach out to if it's something new or unusual we haven't seen before. And then we're able to apply those lessons learned to many other systems. And that's kind of been a uh, lower uh, capital investment that has resulted in significant uh, water system operation improvements. 
Um, again, this is working primarily with very small and rural systems. Um, so I think that's a great program and it's a great example that we would be happy to share with anyone uh, that wanted to talk with us about that. Well, I really appreciate that, Ms. Jard. Thank you for uh, your response and we'll look into that further. Those kinds of uh, state programs uh, with states being really the um, incubators of innovation with regard to either implementation of these programs uh, or uh, planning ahead for uh, the future is, is deeply appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I think we're going to bounce back up uh, the list here and uh, go to Senator Markey. I think you're next, uh, Eddie. Uh, Senator Markey is recognized, please. Let me just run through the list if I can. Uh, we have a vote that I think is just beginning right now. Uh, the first of two votes, it'll be a 30 minute uh, vote. And uh, we'll have to figure out uh, how uh, we're going to make this work. I think we can. But it'll be Senator Markey, followed by Senator Bozeman, followed by uh, on WebEx, Senator Stabenow. And uh, then uh, we're going to work in Senator Kelly and Senator Padilla uh, into to this. I, I might want to recognize that one or both of you go vote right now. One or, one or both of you go vote right now. Come right back so we can keep this running, okay? If you could do that, yeah. just expeditiously though, all right, thank you, all right. On delay, on delay, as we say in Delaware. Okay, so I think uh, Ed Markey is next. Senator Markey, Eddie. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman. very much. Um, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, communities of color are 40% more likely to have drinking water systems that consistently fail to meet safety standards in our country. Uh, and to address that clog in the system last year, I introduced the CLEAR Act legislation to, to provide more support for disadvantaged communities uh, with additional financial assistance and new provisions allowing communities to purchase filters to or hire technical expertise. And I was glad to see these provisions, Mr. Chairman, were included in the Drinking Water Infrastructure Act, which was successfully reported out of our committee uh, last Congress. And, I, uh, and I'm gonna be working hard to include them once again uh, in any drinking water package that is eventually passed into law. Mr. Oley, uh, do you agree that more funding for the assistance for small and disadvantaged communities program would help address inequities, improve public health and increase drinking water quality nationwide. Uh, thank you, Senator Markey, and absolutely, I agree that it would. I think it's an incredibly important issue for us to be addressing, certainly ensuring the most vulnerable populations across the country, including indigenous populations and community of color uh, is incredibly important. And I think also a very big piece to the small system conversation as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Char, do, do you agree that it's important for small and disadvantaged communities to be able to use funds for filters to improve water quality? at point of use? I think it all depends on uh, the point of views, how it's set up, the kind of filters. Um, there are a lot of them out there. It's important. Uh, they do play a role. Um, I would be opposed to widespread use where a utility would have to be the owner, the operator uh, to maintain these devices. Um, we found that citizens are not excited about having um, either rural water district or municipal staff or state staff come into their homes to take samples or to maintain equipment. So I think it's important to strike a balance of using those filters in a responsible way so that we can protect public health in an additional manner. It is definitely a tool in our toolbox that we should uh, keep out there, make available. Um, thank I think you so we much. need to be careful how we structure. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Oley, um, do you do you agree that small and disadvantaged communities can benefit from contracting with nonprofits for technical assistance to better map and manage their drinking water assets? I think it's incredibly important. Many of these systems don't have those expertise or even the technology in-house. We run a program specifically focused on mapping of systems through GIS. Uh, and these systems need those services, both to understand their current infrastructure, but also in the case of an emergency, how to access the system, how to make sure that it's continuing to be operated. Yeah, so, and in, in, in just quickly to conclude, millions of gallons of human and industrial toxic waste 
uh, goes into our rivers every single year, and people deserve deserve to know when our water systems are compromised and our water systems warrant federal funding to alert them. Last Congress, I fought for a change to allow municipalities to use sewer overflow funding for the development of public warning system. Uh, Ms. Powell, do you agree that it's important to allow water systems to use funding to notify the public on combined sewage overflows? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator Markey. I, I do think that um, CSO control requires massive investments um, at, like those that we're making in, in D.C. with the D.C. Clean Rivers Program. Monitoring and notification can be part of those costs. Uh, so depending on the community's needs, I think it's worthy of being eligible for that funding. Yes. No, no thank you. I agree with you 100%. Um, the more notification people get is the more they can protect their own families. So thank you, Ms. Powell. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, the recognition. Senator Markey, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I believe Senator Stabenow is next. Senator Stabenow, are, are you able to join us on WebEx? Yes, yes sir, I am. Senator Stabenow, uh, all right. It is wonderful to be with you on such an important topic, and I couldn't agree more. I, I hope this beats the 80-20 rule, because um, uh, we, we all should, and I know, care deeply about uh, the quality of our, our water systems and sewer systems and so on. So I appreciate you and our ranking member having this very important hearing today. There's perhaps no better example of the importance of safe public drinking water to public health than what happened in Flint, the lead crisis in Flint that uh, our families are still living through. And I want to once again thank uh, uh, Senator Inhofe when he was chairman of this committee uh, for working with me in a wonderful bipartisan way to be able to address this crisis for the people of Flint. Thankfully, the city has replaced almost all the lead service lines now in the city, but water challenges remain and in communities all across Michigan, uh, they remain. In 2018, the state of Michigan required all public water systems to begin replacing all lead service lines starting in January of this year. And the process will occur over a 20 year period. Uh, sounds good, but uh, while, uh, you know, the, the final count on total lead lines across the state isn't exactly known. The estimates are that there are as many as 500,000 in Michigan alone, which could cost as much as two and a half billion dollars to replace. And so there's been a lot of discussion today, important questions ask about how do we deal with this? How do we navigate the challenges? What happens when the communities that have the biggest backlogs uh, that need the most upgrades and fixes are least equipped financially to pay for them? So I will not ask that question, but just lend myself my voice to the fact that it is incredibly important uh, that we address uh, that issue. So I'd like to ask Ms. Chard in, uh, in Michigan and in states across the Great Lakes, combined sewer overflow systems result in billions of gallons of untreated or partially treated water being released during rainstorms. Uh, contamination of our waterways, uh, they pose a serious threat to the health of our communities. Uh, I see this and hear from local elected officials all the time. And as a result of the climate crisis, we know that extreme weather and precipitation events are the new normal, unfortunately, uh, which is creating new stressors on our water and our wastewater systems. So Ms. Chard, in your testimony, you speak at length about this new normal. Uh, do you have suggestions on how we can better embed climate resiliency into our wastewater systems, particularly to address combined sewer overflows? Thank you very much. Um, so first, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm very fortunate in my state. Uh, Oklahoma does not have uh, combined sewers. Those have been outlawed since statehood. Uh, one of the benefits of being a young state. Uh, but the resiliency and what can we do about these significant weather events? I mean, it's so critically important. And what we do on the wastewater side definitely impacts our source water for our drinking water and impacts the treatment needed, our economic development, and so many things. 
um, states like Oklahoma have uh, included requirements in our regulations for redundancy of equipment uh, so that plants are really, if you're only running the minimum treatment, they are um, overbuilt because we want them to be able to treat um, in times of emergency. Uh, but that does come at a cost. And so we have to balance that. Um, we look at um, including uh, redundant power or generators, uh, different sources of power coming into a facility. Uh, we can increase those kinds of provisions and that can help us move forward and be more protective and keep our systems operating in times of emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, in the interest of time, because I know there is a vote going on and others wish to ask questions, I just look, look forward to working with you. This is a really, really important thing for us to tackle and uh, to address. So thank you. Senator Stabenow, uh, I, I learned earlier this week that you've been named the recipient of the uh, Bryce uh, Harlow Award, which really uh, suggests that you are the epitome of the 80-20 rule. And uh, congratulations on, on being named. I uh, look forward to maybe Thanks. being there when you're honored. Thank you. And Thank you. Okay, Thanks. I think uh, next uh, we have uh, Senator Kelly. Senator Kelly, Ke Senator Kelly, all right. If you'd like to uh, to go forward, you're, you're recognized next, followed by Senator Wicker, Senator Sullivan, Senator Padilla, Senator Padilla. Senator Padilla, you may want to consider going and voting right now and just coming back. You may want to consider that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to be brief because I have to go preside here in just a second, but I want to start out with Mr. Oli um, and start out by asking you about drinking water infrastructure on tribal lands. Now, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, and as you know, too many tribal communities still lack access to reliable drinking water infrastructure. And the current drought conditions are only making matters worse. You know, we've got to do more to support the drinking water infrastructure in our tribal communities. That's why I urge Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito to ensure that Arizona's tribal communities were eligible for the EPA's Indian Reservation Drinking Water Program. And I'm pleased to see that the upcoming water infrastructure legislation will include this request, which is a big step. Mr. Oley, if this legislation is enacted, how could this funding help tribes improve their drinking water systems? And what more can this committee do to ensure that tribal communities have safe drinking water and functioning wastewater systems? Thank you very much for the question, Senator Kelly. And this is an incredibly important issue across the country. Uh, EPA's latest estimates say that there's a three point $8 billion need in drinking water infrastructure across uh, tribes across the country. What I would say is the first and foremost thing is the funding that comes with it that hopefully is in grant uh, dollars so that these communities can access them, but maybe even more importantly, the technical assistance that, that comes alongside that to work directly with tribes so they can work through the paperwork and, and all of the necessary items to, to actually access the funding itself. One thing we know is capacity at tribes in some cases is very low, and so ensuring that there's Qualify technical assistance providers to assist those tribes in accessing the funding is critically important. Well, thank you, Mr. Oli, and I yield back the remainder of my time. All right, Senator Kelly, you're going to go preside, go get him. Uh, I think next on our, our list right now uh, is Senator Wicker. Senator Wicker, are you able to join us remotely? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, thank Senator you Wicker, very welcome. Much. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me all right? So you're loud and clear. Good. I, I want to ask Mr. Oley and Mr. McNulty about um, optional set-asides. Last year, the committee unanimously approved America's Water Infrastructure Act. This bill included a provision that I championed along with others to allow states to set aside up to 2% of their clean water state revolving funds to provide technical assistance to small, rural, and tribal publicly owned treatment works. Um, can um, each of you, Mr. Oley and Mr. McNulty, comment about uh, how optional set-asides within state revolving funds um, provide flexibility and the extent to which they're helpful? Thank you, Senator Wicker. Yes, we fully support the 2% set-aside. We think it's a really vitally important piece to ensuring that small communities get access to that technical assistance. 
And what we see through that is that technical systems provides work on technical, managerial, and financial aspects of water system management. It ensures that those systems are sustainable in the long run, that they've got the financial resources to access, but also the set aside in particular sends just a critically important note to states about how important this technical assistance program is. As a Senator, uh, that is an incredibly successful program here in West Virginia. We're, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, we're already using it. We've been using it for years and we just applaud the effort to continue uh, to, to do that and, and even increase that funding. Okay, well, let's you just um, let's, Mr. McNulty, you stay on on the line here because I, I, I want to give everybody an opportunity to talk about this if you want to. Do we have enough um, trained personnel? The Labor Department last year recognized my state of Mississippi um, for uh, the, the apprenticeship program. Uh, we're training five apprentices. Um, how does a shortage of trained water operators affect a system and has this been a problem for you and West Virginia, Mr. McNulty, and then we'll ask uh, the other panelists to answer in turn. Uh, yes, it's a it's a big problem. Uh, the uh, with the retirements that are going on right now that we're seeing, especially our smaller communities, they're having a hard time attracting operators. Uh, the uh, you know especially in southern West Virginia in the coal fields. And so, uh, yes, it's a it's a very very important program to uh, to continue with. Mr. Olive and others. Yes, Senator Wicker, the workforce issues that are confronting small and rural uh, communities is really important. We have a silver tsunami coming over the next decade of retirements, uh, and so ensuring that we both build a pipeline of new operators and and folks in the water sector is important but also ensuring that we have good sustainable jobs for those folks, that, that we encourage veterans and, and other folks that would be really great transitions into the water industry uh, is, is important and ensuring that we attract young people into the industry is another key, key component to this. Anyone else? Yes, this is uh, Senator Wicker. This is Keisha Powell uh, from D.C. I, I would agree. Um, I think that with the, it's been difficult to attract replacement workers to the water sector, which makes it um, that much more critical that we focus on this issue and that we put funding behind training uh, a workforce so that our uh, utilities will, um, that, that will have sustainable operations. And I think, uh, you know, in DC, our CEO, uh, David Gaddis, has also uh, implemented workforce apprenticeship programs to make sure that uh, where we have a void, we're, we're trying to use this as an opportunity uh, to uh, train a new workforce, uh, potentially folks that are at risk that might not otherwise look at the water sector. And this is Shelley Chard, if I may just, I will go with yes to everything everyone has said already and also highlight that there are some states that are reaching out uh, through uh, community colleges or vocational schools in trying to increase level of training and working with departments of corrections um, in helping to prepare inmates that are about to come back into society, get some of that training. And we're also seeing some of our retiring operators staying on to assist um, other systems or becoming circuit rider technical assistance providers, which is also a program that's very helpful. Ms. George, how, uh, how important are technical assistant grants? Incredibly important. We know that through training that can be provided, we can extend uh, the lifespan of equipment because it's being properly maintained and operated. Technical assistance providers can also help us make sure we do have adequately trained operators. They can help us with emergency response, which is super important. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Ricker, thanks uh, for joining us uh, remotely. Uh, we've been rejoined by Senator Sullivan, and he'll be, uh, he's recognized next, and he'll be followed by Senator Padilla. Thank you, Senator Padilla, for your patience today as we try to make all this work. Uh, Senator Sullivan, please, thank you, Colonel, Mr. you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I wanna talk to the witnesses really all of you on a, on a topic that I think should 
garner really strong bipartisan support, and that's the issue of communities that are truly underserved. Mm -hmm. And by this, I mean they don't have any water and sewer. They don't have flush toilets. They don't have running water. Mm -hmm. We have that in America. Unfortunately, we have a lot of that in Alaska. And um, I think it's an issue that we just, the, particularly after the pandemic, when communities are told you need to wash your hands five times a day and people don't have running water, um, it's imperative that we address it. This has been a big issue. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your help on this issue in this committee, but we have to do more. These are, by the way, some in my state, some of the most patriotic communities in the country with more veterans in these communities than you can believe. So, Mr. Oley, Mr. McNulty, other members, how do we get to this issue? And it frustrates me, you know, when I hear communities, we had a big debate on Flint, Michigan. That was a obviously horrible issue. But the discussion there was how do we deal with aging infrastructure. I think there's an even more important issue. How do we deal with communities that have no infrastructure? Zero, zilch. So any thoughts on that? How we can take care of these people first before we look at upgrading systems? There are Americans, thousands in my state, who have no running water and no flush toilets. They live like they're in a third world and they have diseases and health challenges that reflect that. How do we put an end to this? Mr. Orley, why don't you start? Senator Sullivan, Sullivan thank, thank you very much uh, for the question. And I've been up in Alaska and seen some of the communities that you're referencing. And you're right, uh, we need to focus specifically on these communities where there is no infrastructure. Uh, I would say, first and foremost, we need to both ensure there's funding there, but technical assistance that's really tailored to communities that can be culturally appropriate for Alaska Native communities or other, other indigenous communities that understand the complex issues that you're dealing with in Alaska and other really remote areas of the country to ensure that whatever infrastructure we're able to put in place works in that environment and works yeah. for that community and also obviously is affordable in the way that it's, that it's implemented. Other panelists, Mr. McNulty, do you have a view on this? I certainly agree with what Mr. Oley has said. Uh, you know, I think we're going to have to be creative. Um, you know, centralized systems aren't always going to be the best option. Uh, we'll have to look at more community specific systems, perhaps, that would be managed under an umbrella of a larger utility. And I think that's one way that uh, we can assist communities without uh, without the population density to have a, a, a larger, a large centralized system or to transport water long distances or wastewater. Let me, let me uh, dive into that a little bit more and, um, and the other panelists, I'd welcome your views on this too. How do we, it's not just money, although money matters, right, in, in this situation. And to me, again, you know, we have this uh, euphemism in Alaska we call honey buckets. It's not sweet as you would imagine it's the opposite where people literally have to bring their human waste out of their house and dump it into a lagoon that's america it shouldn't happen it shouldn't happen um but how do we design systems in communities like this to where if we have the money to set them up we are able to maintain them in a way that is more of a uh, simplistic design that's not so complicated that breaks down frequently another challenge we have in Alaska. And I'll, I'll just open that up to any of the panelists. Well, this is Charlene Charlie. Leaders. We work with them to form a rural water district or rural sewer district, if that's appropriate. We work through the various funding and we look at um, low technology that they can actually operate, that you don't need um, experts coming in and a lot of chemicals being shipped in, uh, things that we can do to get them on a path to uh, sanitation that most of us take for granted. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. And uh, this is an issue I think we need to work together on in a bipartisan way. No, no American citizen should live in communities that have none of this, that most Americans take for granted. Thank you. 
and a man who just gave a wonderful maiden speech. Uh, I'm so fortunate to have been on the floor when he did it, the Senator from California, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Madam Chair, and appreciate you uh, being the presiding officer during that time. So we're, we're bonded forever now. <laughs> Uh, just a, a quick comment before I raise a couple of uh, questions and issues on uh, the prior senator's uh, line of questioning. I couldn't agree more, but also uh, would uh, heed caution for this committee to make the false choice between better serving underserved communities versus serving unserved communities when it comes to water infrastructure. Uh, I don't think we have to make a choice. We have to do both. Uh, and ultimately, it is a question of resources and funding, which is a topic that I will get to uh, in my couple of questions here with limited time. Uh, but first, I wanted to raise the uh, issue of equity when it comes to you know, water service, water infrastructure, uh, and cost. Uh, Safe uh, drinking water is uh, clearly fundamental to public health. We, we would all agree about that on a bipartisan basis. However, reliable access to safe, affordable drinking water is not yet a true reality. Uh, and I speak for the nearly 1 million Californians who cannot drink their tap water due to contamination. It's also not yet a reality for the 1 in 8 California households who owe an estimated $1 billion dollars in unpaid water bills. This water debt crisis is felt not just across California, but across the country in both urban as well as rural communities with particular impacts on communities of color. According to California water boards, zip codes with higher percentages of Latino and black populations have not just a higher percentage of households with some level of water debt, they have a higher average level of actual water debt and a higher percentage of households with very high levels of water debt exceeding $600. Now the COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated water affordability challenges among low income households. And unlike other basic utilities colleagues, we lack a national long-term water affordability program. So in my mind, to build back better for everyone, we must recognize that infrastructure isn't equitable if it's not affordable. So, uh, Ms. Powell, you noted in your testimony, and I'll quote, that most utilities have raised rates for years to meet the compliance obligations of the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. It must be recognized that it is important for the federal government to regulate if it is important for the federal government to regulate, it is equally important to provide funding to meet these increasingly stringent requirements. For the burden from this disparity is often borne by households of color and contributes to an increasingly acute environmental justice challenge. So, Ms. Powell, what steps would you recommend that this committee take to avoid widespread water shutoffs from occurring uh, in all communities, frankly, as a result of the looming water debt crisis. And uh, after you speak, I want to touch on uh, historic levels of federal funding for a minute. Ms. Powell. Yeah, yes, sir. And thank you, Senator P Padilla, for the question. Uh, the grandmother on a fixed income that I referenced in my testimony was my own. Uh, in, her, uh, in her senior year, she was faced with uh, having to pay her other expenses pay her water bill or possibly lose her home. Um, and I don't think that in this country, anyone's grandmother should be in that position. Um, and I think what you said about it not being an either or proposition for uh, unserved or underserved communities to have what they need to thrive on equal footing, to be able to take advantage of the, uh, of the uh, economic benefits of infrastructure investments, uh, that is something that should be available for, for all communities. And I think uh, what we need to do is make sure that there are higher levels of funding uh, and maintain the low-income water assistance program that has been established uh, during this pandemic and make sure that it's funded so that it can assist uh, more communities. Thank you. And uh, I just want to acknowledge colleagues uh, for our consideration that federal funding for water systems has fallen by 77% in 
in real terms since its peak in 1977, forcing local utilities to take on loans and raise bills in order to upgrade infrastructure, to comply with the safety standards uh, that we now mandate, and to adapt to extreme weather conditions caused by climate change like droughts and floods. In 1977, the federal government spent about $76.27 per person in 2014 dollars on water infrastructure. By 2014, that support fell to just $13.68 per person. Uh, and so uh, again, whether it's through the use of uh, state revolving funds or other tools, uh, we need to be an equal partner in funding and financing uh, compliance and upgrades, not just uh, regulating and uh, applying mandates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a second round of questions. Uh, Senator Carper will be uh, headed back. He's voting right now. Um, so I would like to begin the second round. Um, uh, as co-founder of the Senate's Environmental Justice Caucus, I commend the Biden administration for prioritizing environmental justice through executive action. Yet administrative action alone will not be enough. Environmental injustice has deep roots in our country. And upending decades of inequity will ultimately require Congress to act. As a country, we've allowed the vicious cycle of forcing communities of color and low-income households to breathe dangerous air and drink toxic water to persist for far too long. And that is why any effort to build back better must start with the roots, with the pipes that comprise our drinking water and wastewater systems. As we develop a comprehensive proposal to fix and improve our nation's drinking water and wastewater systems, what programs or policies should we be prioritizing to make sure such investments also promote environmental justice? I'd like to ask that of the full panel as well, again, in the order that you um, presented. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. I think that it's important to make sure, as you pointed out, uh, this administration uh, has prioritized equity and environmental justice, and I think that the policies need to reflect that. I think where uh, funding programs are concerned, we have to make sure that those communities that are underserved, those communities that have been most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, those communities that have been most vulnerable to lead in drinking water, uh, have the resources that they need, again, to thrive on equal footing with, with every other community. And so when we look at funding programs, uh, as you are, are considering, uh, not only higher levels of funding, but also considering more grant funding, recognizing that uh, those underserved communities that have environmental justice challenges may not be able to take advantage of loans to address the issues that they grapple with. And so that is something that um, as we look at uh, those funding programs, we, we have to make sure that they work for everyone, uh, even as we're looking at how much, how much additional funding we're putting into those programs. Thank you. Ms. Chard? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I think this is an area that's an opportunity where we can be creative and think outside the box a little bit. Um, as we start working with um, these disadvantaged communities, rural communities, uh, some of them are served by their own independent system, but some of them may be uh, subsections of existing uh, much larger water systems. So I think we need to look at what we can do to assist those communities. Uh, and we can do some of that through some of the funding that is kind of non-traditional uh, for the uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. If we look at some of the funding that the Department of Agriculture has through their rural development program, you know, they can help us a lot there also boots on the ground technical assistance providers working with the states. We have the um, Department of Energy Grand Water Security Challenge. Um, that's funding that can allow uh, industries and others to innovate uh, water savings, water efficiency, um, and that can free up fresh water for drinking that may need less uh, treatment if we are reusing industrial waters for industrial purposes. Uh, so I think we can do a lot of different things. We just have to uh, think a little bit differently than we have in traditional funding and traditional operation. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oli. Thank you, Senator. I think obviously the, the grant funding and forgivable loan funding is important. 
accompanied by technical assistance, but I also think the flexibility that needs to be built into those funding programs is really important. Because as you heard Senator Sullivan talk about, there are gonna be different options that work in different communities based on the local needs. And so creating flexibility within the funding programs to align and, and focus on solutions that work in different regions of the country in different ways is really important. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Oli, not all communities are able to afford the most advanced water systems or, or around the clock operators. However, they still need to be able to provide safe, reliable water to their customers. In Illinois, we have towns that are so desperate for assistance in updating their wastewater or drinking water infrastructure. Yet they have no idea where to start or what funding opportunities even exist for them. Could you help explain how nonprofit organizations like uh, RCAP can help these systems and address why federal funding for technical assistance grants is so important? You've touched on this already, but I'm gonna give you time to um, uh, expand. Thank you, Senator. It's a fundamental aspect of the work that, that we do on the ground with communities. It's helping communities both understand where funding opportunities exist, what you have to have in place to actually go in and, and apply for those, but also helping with the actual applications. Many of these communities don't have the capacity for a grant writer or someone who may understand all the intricacies of federal funding opportunities. And so technical assistance providers can be utilized to help communities both understand where and what options there are for funding, but also how to actually access those funding, how to maintain all of the rules and requirements that come with that funding and ensure that their systems are sustainable in the long run. I couldn't agree with you more. Some of these municipalities literally have a mayor and maybe one other person and that's it. Um, Ms. Shard, um, as the former president of the uh, Association of State Drinking Water Administrators, you understand what happened in Flint was an absolute disgrace but you also know that this is not an issue that is limited to just one town. In my state of Illinois, we have a, almost a quarter of all the lead service lines in the nation. With EPA's recent decision to delay the enforcement date of the lead and copper rule, I am encouraged that the Biden administration will take a more aggressive approach on the war against lead than the previous administration. That being said, the cost of full pipe replacement is huge and some places will never be able to afford this without help. Ms. Chard, can you tell us why federal funding through programs like the SRFs, lead reduction grants, and reducing lead in school grants are critical for protecting our communities? Uh, thank, thank you, you Senator. Senator. And I really appreciate the opportunity um, to speak on this issue. Uh, we have to address lead service lines. We have to address the end problem, which is lead in drinking water. Um, as we, you know, go through a review of the proposed rule and we'll see how it all turns out in the end, but everybody has the same end goal and that is uh, getting the lead out of our drinking water and funding programs at the federal level and at the state level have to happen in order for that expense to be manageable. Otherwise, we end up in a situation of where only the very wealthy areas can afford to do that kind of service line replacement. But we also need to focus on what we can do to minimize uh, the lead leaching from those in-home plumbing fixtures. Uh, that's a part of this that sometimes gets missed, that we have old plumbing fixtures in homes, in schools, in daycares. Uh, that's an area where we need to focus uh, technical assistance and treatment operation at the plant, and we need to work with uh, those facilities in our cities and our towns. We have a work group in Oklahoma that includes the Department of Education and the state PTA, uh, getting them on board and working with us to look at treatment and look at uh, grant programs that they could put together to help uh, with those replacement of equipment in those uh, vulnerable populations that are served. So we have a lot of different options, but we have to fund them and we have to look at what are the right decisions for each of our communities and those populations served in order to truly be successful. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you. I yield back to the chairman who's back from his vote. Thank you. Nice job. You look like you've been doing this forever. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for your leadership on these issues, and thanks so much for, for chairing while we somehow make all, all this work this morning. 
And to our witnesses, it's not always this uh, crazy, but um, it's an important issue. I'm glad we're able to make it all work, and most of our members are coming and asking uh, questions. And uh, we appreciate very much, again, your participation uh, near and far. I didn't realize, uh, Ms. Powell, you're right here in the same room. This room is about the size of RFK Stadium. So uh, you're over there, the other end of the bleachers. But welcome. It's nice of nice to join us in, in, uh, in person. They, uh, among the things I've, I've heard as we've gone through this hearing uh, is the, uh, the need for, uh, uh, to uh, focus on retirements. And the, we, people never retire around here, at least not very often. But uh, I, I've, almost everyone who's spoken today is talking about the need to, uh, to train, provide training for folks to fill the shoes of those who are retiring in the next five, 10 years. Uh, Ms. Powell, how, how much of an issue is that for you here in, in, um, in, uh, in your jurisdiction here in D.C.? Uh, I think it's an issue for us. Um, like every other utility, we, uh, you know, we're faced with trying to find replacement workers and, and seeing uh, uh, a, uh, folks with uh, a lot of experience. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's all I need. That's all I need. But it's an issue. This is an it issue. Is, an important yeah. issue. Good. Uh, Ms. Chard, same question. This is this an important issue or not for, for you folks? Absolutely important, important issue um, at the utility level and at the state and federal level because if regulators are writing rules and they don't have the experience or the knowledge, it just makes the problem for the regulated community so okay. much worse. Thanks, Ms. Chard. Mr. McNulty, Michael, is, what kind of problem is this in West Virginia and Mountain State? It's a big problem, Senator. It's very, very important to us. Okay, uh, Mr. Oley, same question. Is this an I issue of concern? I would um, say it's one of the most important issues confronting small and rural and tribal communities across the country. All right, the American Recovery Plan, plan which just passed and signed into uh, law by the president about a week ago, includes a, a dramatic increase in the Economic Development Administration (EDA) from three hundred million dollars uh, to three billion dollars, and uh, a piece of that money might be available to uh, help in this retraining effort. Thank you. The other uh, monies that are in the, the same piece of legislation uh, are set aside or, I think, earmarked for, for retooling, retraining uh, workers in skills that are hard to find. And uh, so in a day and age, uh, and I think of my native West Virginia when I think of this, but day and age when we have a lot of folks who are looking for work, would love to have a job. Their, their previous jobs have gone away. And we need people who can work in the utilities industry for, and, and make sure we get water, clean water to, to drink and deal with our wastewater. Uh, this seems like maybe a marriage made in heaven, and we would, uh, it's a good one for us to take advantage of. Uh, a question I want to ask a question, this would be for the entire panel. I want each of you to uh, take uh, no more than a minute in responding, if you would, but communities across uh, this country have water systems that are aging, as we've heard repeatedly. Many citizens are inadequately sized to address community water needs and are comprised of antiquated and banned equipment, such as uh, lead pipes. And we've seen this play out in community after community. And my question is, we'll start with, uh, with you, Ms. Powell. Do you believe that uh, supporting local investments in drinking water and wastewater infrastructure is a vital, the word vital, federal responsibility? If so, why? I absolutely do, uh, Senator Carper. And I think uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, one, because um, it certainly supports the communities, uh, the public health and welfare of our communities, but it's also, it also provides an economic uh, opportunity. Uh, for every million dollars that we invest in our infrastructure, there's an economic impact of 15 and a half jobs. And uh, at a time like this, I think the water sector has a shot to, to, to be part of getting this country back on its feet if we have the money to invest. All right, thanks. Thanks. Same question. Broadery and investment um, as we move forward. Thanks. Thank for I, I like to think of it as a shared responsibility. It's not all in the federal government, but a shared responsibility. Uh, Mr. McNulty uh, from West Virginia. Go ahead, Mr. McNulty, please. Same question. Uh, yes, I, I agree, Senator. Uh, this is a shared responsibility. Uh, we certainly need clean water. We need that investment in our communities to uh, for, for economic development, uh, as well as for the health and safety, especially for those those that are most vulnerable. Uh, so uh, again, I, I think it's uh, uh, vital that we have uh, the federal support. All right, thank you. And the same question, Mr. Oley, thank you. Yes, thank you, Senator. I think water access and wastewater access is one of the most underappreciated parts of economic development and economic growth. 
No business is going to stay or grow in a community without access to sanitary wastewater. No family that has the means to is going to stay in a community without access to safe drinking water. And so uh, water and wastewater access and affordable water and wastewater access is an incredibly uh, important piece of the economic development puzzle. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Mr. Oli, if you'll just stay with us, I'd uh, follow up question on resiliency, please. There's a lot of uh, discussion right now about reinvesting, reinvesting in aging infrastructure and ensuring our systems are resilient to climate to change, uh, not just now, but well into the future. Rural and small water systems are significantly more burdened uh, by system aging, by climate change, because they operate in such uh, thin, thin margins. Question, how is the RCAP helping small systems prepare for and address our changing climate and the resulting extreme weather events, please? So we work with communities of all shapes and sizes in different regions of the country on these issues, whether you're talking about coastal erosion, whether you're talking about flooding issues that have become more prevalent. We're working with communities to help them build the resiliency on the front end, but certainly obviously also on the back end of recovery as these uh, events continue to happen. It's our focus to try and help build capacity at the local level to take on these issues and ensure they've got the expertise and know how to actually execute on those. All right, thanks for that uh, response. Let me just follow up the same, uh, same issue, resiliency, please. Question of Mr. McNulty. Uh, would, uh, would you just share with us what uh, your experience has been in Morgantown and in West Virginia in addressing more frequent extreme weather events? Mr. McNulty. Uh, we've, we've undergone uh, several flooding issues here over uh, since uh, 2001. And uh, the the uh, uh, technical assistance provided by our Rural Water Association has been uh, just uh, invaluable in, get, in getting these folks uh, back on their feet and other utilities coming to their aid, uh, especially down in Clay, Wyoming, um, uh, McDowell counties. I mean, they've just been ravaged. So uh, we're seeing the, the, these programs, uh, the uh, rural water programs are just uh, wonderful programs to help. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, Keisha Powell, uh, I, uh, let's, uh, maybe a question on infrastructure maintenance, okay? Ms. Powell, uh, you are currently, I understand the CEO, is that right, the CEO of the DC Water? COO, I'm sorry. COO, okay. Uh, maybe someday, see, we'll see. Uh, but today the CEO, uh, CEO, future CEO of DC Water, uh, but you have had uh, leadership roles, I'm told, in other, communities including Jackson, Mississippi, is that right? Yes, sir. And as you know, uh, uh, Jackson still has uh, large parts of the community without access to water about after the uh, winter storms that shut down expansive parts of the South, including the entire state of Texas. As, uh, as I understand it, Jackson has yet to fully implement its full suite of options to respond to the storm. What happened in Jackson could have been any community in America. Climate change is making the concerns of aging infrastructure even more prevalent and worrisome. Question, uh, Ms. Powell, can you speak uh, more about what it takes to maintain an aging infrastructure network like Jackson, like Jackson, and make uh, upgrades while keeping rates affordable? It's a little like changing the engine of an airplane while you're in flight. Go ahead. It absolutely is. And, and if you've been in that position, uh, it, it's nothing more deflating for a water operator uh, to be fighting, uh, keeping, uh, or pr continuing to provide service uh, to a community with infrastructure uh, failure after infra infrastructure failure. Um, I think the, the importance of maintaining what we have cannot be underscored. We talk a lot about investing in infrastructure to build new. Uh, because of regulatory programs that, that we have, uh, we, we have to sometimes build new infrastructure like the DC Clean Rivers program uh, at $2.7 billion. But when you've got uh, billions of dollars of assets in the ground, uh, and as you pointed out, ASCE's uh, uh, data point that there's a, a water main break every two minutes in this country, uh, that underscores the need to maintain what, what's already there. Um, and I, I think we have to do both. We have to have uh, funding levels that allow us to build new, um, uh, to leverage opportunities for new technology. We also have to, to have the funding to be able to maintain our infrastructure, to maintain our plants, our pump stations, so that we can serve reliably and we can achieve a level of resilience. All right. 
With your uh, DC uh, water hat on, uh, let's be my, my last uh, question for this hearing. Uh, I, I, I take it back, I'm gonna ask every, in a wrap up question for everybody. Just one, one point you would really drive, hard, drive home. Just one point from my colleagues and me uh, with respect to the issues of before us today. Just one point you think is this, ex, ex, if you, it's already been said, that's fine, say it again. Just reiterate, the repetition is good. Uh, question uh, with respect to DC water, Ms. Powell. DC water provides water uh, for all here in the nation's capital, we thank you for that. And all around uh, the country, the situation is the same, safe, we want safe, we want uh, resiliency, we want reliable service, it's all critical. Uh, would you just take a minute and discuss the steps DC Water has or is taking to address risks or vulnerabilities to water delivery and ensure it is resilient to climate change? Just briefly, one minute, please. Thank you. Yes, sir, um, and thank you for the question. We, we're taking several steps. We're making sure that our infrastructure in the ground uh, can, can reliably serve. Uh, the, the district, we know that uh, we have some very important customers here. Uh, it can be a matter of national security to make sure that we have uh, uh, our systems intact. Uh, we're also looking at cyber and making sure that uh, we have a cyber uh, security infrastructure in place uh, that can support our systems. Uh, we have teams in place that are constant lo constantly looking at gaps. Um, to, to make sure that we close those gaps and maintain a state of, of readiness at all times to respond. Um, but all of those things take funding. Uh, and if we don't have that in, in terms of, of being able to access federal funding, then that has to come from our ratepayers. So I would uh, just continue to ask and knock what urges for higher levels of federal funding for, uh, for, the, for the water sector. Fair enough. Thank you, thank you so much. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Keep that in mind. Well, we need billions. All right, well, that's a lot of DC. grease. Okay, <laughs> thank you. And thanks for, again for being with us today. Uh, real quick, a wrap up question, just uh, no more than 30 seconds per person. Uh, one point you'd really like to hammer home. We remember nothing else from what you said. Uh, let's hear from you right now. Uh, repeat whatever it is. Mr. Uh, Ms. Chard, Ms. Chard, you go first, please. Uh, so I would just say very simply, the setting of standards by EPA or Congress, that is not um, ultimately what protects public health. It's getting those standards implemented and we need funding to get those standards implemented and protect public health. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks. Mr. McNa Mr. McNulty, please. Same question. Uh, debt forgiveness, Senators. Uh, so many of our rural systems are struggling. They, uh, they're so debt heavy. There's no room to grow, and if uh, you could find a way to uh, to forgive a lot of that debt, that would be wonderful. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, and it's great to have you uh, here. I just got a very nice uh, text message yesterday from Gordon Gee, president of West Virginia University here, uh, Morgantown. That's you probably the guy you probably know. He calls me a a, a Buccaneer combination of Ohio State Buckeye and a Mountaineer State. I love. Buccaneers. I've been called a lot worse than that. Uh, Mr. Oley, please, Mr. Oley. Yes, just the knowledge and need to fund more technical assistance to ensure that communities that need these funds the most get access to them and understand how to access those funds. All right, fine. Thank you, sir. And uh, Ms. Powell, you get to the last uh, swing here. Yes, sir. I would say that um, you know we have to push past equity to achieve environmental justice. We, we have to look beyond investing equally uh, uh, among infrastructure sectors and focus on investing equitably. And to coin a phrase of a good friend, uh, this is water's moment, and we have a clear opportunity here to help the country get back on its feet. Give us a shot. That's great. With respect to, to equity, I, the first uh, slogan I ever heard related that it comes from, it's repeated actually in every major religion of the world. I, I think you find it in the Old Testament, the New Testament, but every major religion of the world. And it's uh, the golden rule. Treat other people the way we want to be treated. That's what uh, racial justice is all about. Whether people live on the other side of the street, the other side of town, or the other side of the world, we have a moral obligation to them. And, uh, and to always uh, keep in mind the least of these in our society, and that includes making sure they have clean water to drink. It's been a great hearing, uh, an, an unusual hearing, but in the end, I think a terrific hearing. I'm grateful for, I really want to say to our, our, uh, our majority staff led by by um, uh, Mary Frances Repco and our uh, leader of our water team, uh, John Keane, and 
on the Republican side, the uh, minority side, I want to say many, many thanks to Adam and the team that, that, that he leads for Senator Capito. And uh, we appreciate Senator Duckworth and Senator Lummis and their leadership with their subcom relevant subcommittees, uh, too. I, I want to ask um, unanimous consent to place all materials into the records. Materials uh, to submit for the record a number of reports, articles, and statements for the record focus on the need for federal investment in drinking water and clean water related infrastructure for our nation. These materials show that the nation's infrastructure has suffered from inadequate uh, investments and from extreme weather and climate related events that are happening far too frequently. And just a real quick uh, closing statement. Uh, I, um, uh, to all of our witnesses, uh, whether they happen to be coming in from Oklahoma or right across the room here, or West Virginia, or uh, some other place, we're happy to see you in person or, or, or uh, remotely. And for whoever develops these systems makes all this work. Uh, when so many things could have gone wrong today and they didn't, I'm just uh, grateful. Uh, I'm struck by the bipartisan consensus that we've heard today. And uh, we're a, a committee that's, I think, known for the way how that way that we work together, sort of the 80-20 rule. And I'm almost uh, tempted to ask everyone here to stay together with sing a little kumbaya. Maybe a verse or two of kumbaya would probably be appropriate. And, but in all uh, serious, uh, at any uh, point in this hearing, I really had the sense that if I were blindfolded and didn't know who was at the microphone uh, on our side, you know, here on, on this side of the dais, I probably would have no idea whether the senator speaking was a Democrat or a Republican. And that's exactly the way it, it should be on issues like these, because we all know that the need for uh, clean, safe water isn't a red state or a blue state issue. It's a human issue, one that we have a, a shared moral responsibility to address. So I'm proud we've come together in common purpose today, and my hope will continue to uh, matter to take action to bring safe, clean uh, water to the, um, the American people. And uh, for some final housekeeping, centers will be allowed to submit uh, questions for the record the, through a close of business on March 31st. That's through close of business on March 31st. Uh, we'll compile those questions, we'll send them to our witnesses, and we'll ask our witnesses to reply to them by April 14th, April 14th, if you would. And with all of that, I think, if I can find my, uh, oh, here we go. With all of that, it's a wrap.